Good morning. Um, welcome to today's lecture. So, um, Barry told you, I think that today we are going to focus on um, one small computation and quantum computing. Why are we doing this? So, to start with a small spoiler, so quantum computers are not um, from the from the point of view of quantum algorithms. So, which algorithms can you run on quantum computers? Quantum computers don't allow speed ups for um, the algorithms that are needed for AI training. So AI training, as you know, works with neural networks nowadays. Most of the, at least the, the AI training that is, that is you know, gaining traction um, among the general public, like ChatGPT, that's trained using, using so-called neural networks, and they can't be run on quantum computers. Well, they can be run on quantum computers, but they can't be run more efficiently then um, they can't be run more efficiently than on a, on a normal computer. And, and, and so, but why are we still looking at it? Because we believe it's a very important trend and so you should understand it. Um, so, so we, last time I was here in March, we already spoke about computation. I would like to take up this once more, but last time I used um, for computation, I used as a paradigm, um, the um, church approach with recursive functions. Now I want to do Turing machines as well, just quickly, because I think it, it's very important paradigm to understand. And then we will talk about logic gate based computation, quantum mechanics and quantum computing. And my goal is, so, is to allow you as philosophers to understand it and also as computer scientists, for those who are computer scientists, to understand enough of quantum mechanics, not at, mathematically, but at a you know more verbal level of description, so that you can get the basic idea of how quantum computers function. Um, it, so um, we saw last time already that if you want to understand AI agents, you need to understand models, computable algorithms, and complex systems. And and uh, today we are going to speak and tomorrow again about computation. So I think Barry has spoken about this at length, right? About models and modeling. Not, not yesterday. Yeah, so just to remind you, so what we are doing when we are programming computer, um, no matter what is supposed to run, it's a model in the sense of science. So it's, it's a representation of an aspect of reality using abstract symbols that is created to describe, explain, or predict the aspects of a reality in question, unless it's a purely mathematical task, like calculating a, a huge prime number. If you calculate a huge prime number, then that's not a model of reality. Then that, that is something else which we can't discuss now, but most models that are put into computers are models of reality. And we say that a model is adequate if relative to some set of requirements, it can be used to engineer an entity or an emulation that satisfies the requirements, like an Airbus A320 satisfies of the requirement of transporting a certain amount of, of, of weight or passengers and cargo uh, over you know, the, the Atlantic, for example. Um, and a synoptic model is a model of a system that can be used to engineer a given system or emulate its behavior. So now what is a Turing machine? So Turing asked, what is a computable function? And uh, he, his answer in 1937 or 36 was, a mathematical function is computable if an algorithm can be formulated that performs this function on a Turing machine. And so if the algorithm P computes a function F, which maps T to N uh, with T element uh, of the set N exponent K, if P yields the value F of N1 to NK upon the input N1 to NK element of T, after a finite number of steps, then it is computable. And, um, it cannot yield an output if you input a vector. So this, this is a vector, right? Like a vector n1 for nk. If that vector is not as within t, which is a domain of the computation, that won't create an output. So for example, if you give um, JGBT uh, an image, it can't do anything with it because its domain is language and, and also mathematics, actually. Um, uh, uh, but it can't deal with images but wall E, I think it's called, is a neural network that is that, that has its domain images, so you can give it, no, it, it has, I think, its domain text and it creates images. 
And, and but I think you can also give some of these programs an image and say create a, an alternative version of this image. And so that so that, that just says that the computability requires a domain for the function to work on. This is very this is super important slide. I actually didn't think of it when I wrote the slide, but what you can see from this last statement here is the narrowness of, of, of all AIs. Because whenever an AI gets an input that is not an element of the set of its domain, it will just fail. And so all AIs, but by this definition, all AI algorithms that can ever exist are always made for a certain domain, right? And if, and if you get outside this domain, it will not compute. And so, and so I, I think with this slide alone, you can already refute the notion of general AI because humans don't work like this, right? Humans can always take vectors of input from a domain that they have not been prepared for. Also, animals can do this, and that is what is called natural intelligence. But computers can always only compute something for the set of the domain of computation for which they were prepared. Now, um, the Turing machine is a model of a computable function. A universal Turing machine can compute all computable functions. So this is a universal Turing machine. This is a universal Turing machine. This inside there is a universal Turing machine, right? So all your 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 the mobile phones and computers you have they are universal Turing machines. So so the, the, the Turing machine is is a tape divided into cells. Each cell contains a symbol from some finite alphabet zero, usually zeros and ones. The alphabet contains a special blank and one or more other symbols. There's a head which is called Q here that can read and write symbols on the tape and move the tape left and right in one and only one cell at a time. Um, in some models the head moves and the tape is stationary that doesn't matter. Um, there's a state register that stores the state of the Turing machine, one of finitely many. Among these is the special start state with which the state register is initialized. Now there's a finite table of instructions that given the state Q1, the machine is currently in and the symbol A1, it is reading on the tape. So right now this, the head is Q1, is reading the symbol zero. Um, uh, and it's reading the symbol and tells the machine what to do next. Um, it can either erase or write a symbol, and then it can move, it can move the head. And so, so this is how it works. And here you have a simple Turing machine that doubles the number of ones it reads and inserts a zero between the two series of ones. So it's defined by these parameters here, M equals, and then there's a, a series of symbols. So Q are the states of the machine, sigma, Capital sigma is its alphabet, um, input alphabet, gamma is the tape alphabet, and um, and th these this is and so this, if you look at it, it has a, a delta as a state transition function that lets um, the machine move from one state to the other. So the machine will replace a one one it reads on the tape by a one 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 zero on one. So it doubles the ones it reads and separates them by a zero. That's all it does. And to do this, you have on the Turing machine you need as you see here, six states. And so here we see what it does. So the, the, the tape it has to work on is prepared. We have two ones and three zeros. And at the end, as you see here, it will have written two ones, a zero and two ones, and then it, it stops. So, that, so that's, that, that's all it does. Sorry. And, and let's, let's see how this works. So in state S1, it, it actually, um, reads the one and then it, it replaces it by a zero and moves one step right. So you see here it has replaced it by a zero, is now in state two and has, has moved one step right. So in step, in, in this, now it reads a one and it's, um, it's staying, uh, it's staying in, um, in, uh, in state two, but then it, but it moves on um, one to the right. By moving one to the right, um, it was he it, it gets here, right? So now it reads a zero um, and it moves one further to the right. And here it it's it reads a zero, it's now getting in, it getting into 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 stage three and so on. So this basically this the state transit it's called a finite state automaton. This finite state automaton describes what the Turing machine do, does. And it perfectly determines its behavior. So you could now give it, you know, a tape with a million ones, 
and uh, a million and two zeros, and it would then move through this algorithm as long as it would take it to fill the whole tape with another million ones and leaving two zeros, sorry, one zero in the middle. And so, and so this is, and all computers are like this. Only that the finite state automaton that is used is of course much bigger than this, you know, but every computer can be in the end reduced to a combination of such finite state automata. And even, so even if, even if I, if I have software running here, ultimately consists when I program software in the higher level programming language, like here I have, um, I think it's called, um, it's a some C dialect, objective C. So if I program for the iPhone with objective C, I create ultimately many, many finite state automata that work together to accomplish such computations. And, and we will learn a bit later how this basically works at the level of the electrons, at the level of the bits. And, and um, so, so this is just basically, all you need to know is just that the, you want to close the door? Thank you. It's basically just that, that it gets more and more complicated with bigger Turing machines, but they all work like this. And every computer that can be, that exists, including the quantum computers, can be represented with such, with such finite state automata. It's just not done because they get bigger and bigger and more and more complicated, but basically to improve that this is the case. And I have here an example of a, of a um, finite but not computable function, which is non-recursive. And, and so, so when a function is non-recursive, you learned last time when I was here that it cannot be computed on a Turing machine. So it's non-computable and it's called the busy beaver function. I will not go through it now because when I wrote this lecture, I didn't realize how much work it was to teach you quantum mechanics. So I need more time for quantum mechanics, at least, you know, one or one. So I will skip this, but in the, but you can read this. It's a super interesting problem. It was invented by, by Tibor Rado, a mathematician. And it's, it's very, very funny. It's, it's very funny. Um, you look, look how simple the Turing machine looks and it can't compute. It can't finish. It's, it's just, it's just super. And, and I go, I explained quite well here. You, then you have one, um, how it, what it does, how it works. You know, it's job is to put, to, to put the whole tape full of ones. And <laughs> it's just so funny. And, and here you see that it becomes uncomputable and why. So it's, it's a super cool problem. Um, but you have to work on it yourself. You will enjoy it. And it's, it's the nice thing about it that you don't have to be a mathematician to understand it, but it shows you really clearly why many prompts are not computer, not computer, but I just, I just have to, I have to skip it. So I want to show you now, before we move to quantum mechanics, um, how logic, so, and do you have any questions on this Turing machine model with the finite state automaton? I mean, the, if you, if you study computer science, you are, you write it. The test about it, it's not so easy. Yeah? Then they give you, they give you, for example, a piece of 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 pseudocode, pseudocode, and then say write down the sequence of finite set automata to achieve the pseudocode. So it's, but you get the principle, I think, right? It's just if you want to apply it yourself, it gets a bit tricky, but it's it's just you know in the end math. So so now getting to to the logic guess computation. So you have to the idea. Um, of, 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 of the binary logic of computers was, was invented. Um, the first to invent this was a German called Konrad Zuse. And at the same time, Americans were trying to do a hexadecimal computer, which used as a computation basis 16, 16 bit representation, right? So two exponent four. And, and, um, and uh, there, there, is, there are hexadecimal, um, is an important principle today in, uh, in computation. But it's only used in high level. But the lowest level of the computations are all bit two bit computers. And so the, each bit can have a zero and a one. And Konrad Zuse realized that this was, was easiest to do because, because you can, because for two reasons, you can use binary, not binary digits, which have, had invented by another German called Leibniz. You've heard of him. And, and, and he realized that he could use the binary digits and that he could use electricity. Now, the first computation machine he built was, was the, that, that really worked and was put into production. It had, I think, five, no, three or four hertz. So it could do four computation. It had a clock of four computations per second. Um, and um, as we will see that the barely suffices to add two numbers. I think you need a few more steps to do this. We will see it a bit later. But, but, but it, it, um, 
but it worked. And then very soon he built also electronic versions. And then of course, IBM started to build electronic versions and so on. But basically the idea is that you are using Boolean logic to, to, to program the computer. And you see it here. So th this, this uh, Boolean logic is called logic gate. And so if you take, so here you see an example of logic gate, it's an end gate, we will just, it's called Gata in German, that's from the German Wikipedia. I, I often use, um, use illustrations from the German Wikipedia because it is, um, along with the Russian, the best for mathematics topics. It's just that I can't, I don't, don't know any Russian, so. <laughs> so I don't use the Russian one. And, and, but I always look at the French, the German and the English version to select which one I should take and often the German is the best. So um, a logic gate is, um, is an idealized or physical device that performs a Boolean function, which is a logical operation performed on one or more binary inputs that produces a single binary output. So there, there's a mistake here, but I won't correct it now. So the end gate, right? It's, it's basically taking, so if you have here um, a current and no current here, you have one zero, then you will have no current output here. You can realize this with a transistor. If you put no current in both, you will not have current here either. If you put current in both, you will have current and so on. So the transistor is set up in a way to basically, to basically implement this truth table, right? So that you get only a one if both of the of the inputs are one, and an OR gate gives you it gives you a electricity on this um, uh, uh, Y output a channel when if one of the channels is has has current on it, right? So so and and if you have now many many of these um, logic gates, you can build a microcircuit, and of and of many microcircuits, you can build a microprocessor. So in the end, in here, you have millions, hundreds of millions of gates combined to, to make up the processor that is working. And, and um, so this is a, a multiplexer. Um, so the multiplexer, um, and it has a truth table, right? So how does it work? Um, it has a control signal called S0. It has an input one, an input two, and output. And you see here that um, the control signal decides on, um, on what is done with the input signals. And um, basically, it's a data selector that selects between several input signals and forwards the selected input into a single output line. So um, if, the, if the control signal is set to zero, you see the output here will only be E0, but if it's set to one, the output will only be E1, right? So it basically suppresses, based on the control signal, it suppresses one of the input channels and only puts forward the other channel. So it's a way of basically selecting which channel should, 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 should move on. And, um, and, and so here, it, it's quite easy. You can see if, if this is zero, they're both zero, then the output will be zero. And so on, for example, if this is one and E1 is zero, this will be zero, but this is one and E1 is one, it will be one. And here's a simplified truth table, which just says, if S0 is zero, then you will have the, the value of E0 as output. If S0 is one, then you have E1 as output, right? And so, and this is the symbol, the official um, uh, symbol used in, in circuits to describe it. And, um, and it's made up of an AND, NOT, and OR gate. So, so you have three gates that you need to put together. And so this truth table is basically what you get when you chain together an end dot on OR gate. So you can see it all the examples how these small um, logic circuits, so these logic gates are put together to create one small circuit. And it's all about, you know, deciding how to, which electrons should, should move out here. Mm. So, so the multiplexer is very abstract, but everybody has used an adder, right? Which is just, if you type into your pocket carriage, the three plus four enter, it, it, it puts out, um, it puts out a seven. Um, and, um, and this adder works like this. So it combines an exclusive or and an end gate. So an exclusive or is, is a gate that, that does this. So if you have two inputs A and B, 
what output do you get? So if you have zero and zero, it will be zero. If you have one and one, it will be zero. And it will be one only if either of them is one. That's why it's called exclusive one, right? And, and or as computer scientists is called saw. And um, the other or um, is, um, it has, of course, this truth table. Um, that's a classical or, and this one is like the Latin veil, right? That's why it's always used also in, 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 in the wood notation with a V, and this one is like out, out in Latin, which means either or, right? And, and, um, so if you if you have now the two inputs here i a and b, then you have a, um, the the carry bit and the output s, and you see if either of them is one you will get a one here, but if they are both one, you get a zero, but you get the carry bit, and the carry bit will be put into the next adder to remember that you have overflown the bits of the of this unit and propagate this into the next adder so that you can get then what children do when they, so when you learn, the carry bit is just this, you know, when you do this, you don't have a carry bit in the digital, in the 10 digit system, but if you do this here, then I, well, well but you can still do it, you get, you put yourself a small one here, then you, because you have 11 and then you have this, it's easier to see when you do this, um, you know, um, some, then you get the one here, you get the one here, you have to add, add the one here, then you get the two here, uh, sorry, you get the one here and the two and then the two, right? So these are the carryover bits. And basically this circuit with the C, it, it, it gives you a carryover bit. And so this is how the, so, and you can see here really nicely how it's made of an exclusive or and, a and, a um, and, um, uh, and and an end gate, and so this is pretty. So so this is pretty nice, I think. Um, and the full adder. This is just when you take. So this is this is made of a. This is the most elementary XOR and end gate. So these are really the basic logic gates. This is now one half adder, and now if you put two half adders together. And combine them with a with an OR gate, then you get the this truth table, which which is called the full adder, right? And so basically, with this you can build any processor because all the other calculations, multiplication, division, and subtraction, can be modeled on the on the addition, right? So so addition is just addition, subtraction is just addition with a negative integer, multiplication is just many many additions. Um, so three times five is just five plus five plus five, and, and division is just the inversion of multiplication. So, so th now you have understood basically how computers work. Right? It's it's really it's really that simple. It's just that the circuits become really really large, you know. And so, and it's it's fascinating when you talk to specialists who, who have as it is a profession. Um, they they say, oh, you know, I had a friend working at Intel, and she said, oh, you know, it's so annoying. This morning, again, one of them mathematicians came to me. She was from England. She said, one of them mathematicians. <laughs> and, 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 uh, you very knows what I mean with this. It's a certain social lab to say one of them came to me and, and wanted again to have something that is not, cannot be realized in binary logic. Why don't they get it? I thought they were mathematicians. She was an engineer. It was so funny. And uh, basically, the trick is to imagine how you can put mathematical operations in this format cleverly so that you can get efficient computation. And here you see just for completeness, how complicated you can get. So the, the, here this defines the C out bit. That's the logical formula expressed in, in propositional logic. And this here is the, is the, S, the S bit, um, which is a sum, and which you see it's a, these are XORs. And we will get back to these symbols, they're very important. You want to ask a question? Yeah, so these, um, I'm just wondering, like, I understand the logic of these gates, mm -hmm. um, but how, how is this done in the engineering? In this actual circuit board, there is 
uh, a set of transistors that is set up to be an XOR gate or yes. Yes. This is set, and then afterwards you need to, when you're doing the software to computer, you're telling it, oh, use these transistors to calculate this sum, and then they can yes. also this is this is this is the, the lowest level code is about this. The lowest level code is when the what the compiler gives out it are instructions for the transistors or the circuit and or the circuits and the circuit elements of the processor. But the programming language is of course abstracted from this, right? Yeah, yeah. But 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 when when you program, for example, in, in, in C or C or any other high level language, ultimately when it gets compiled, it gets transformed into machine code that tells the transistors, uh, that tells the processor what to do. Right. But in, in principle, if you build uh, a very simple computer that just has a full uh, adder, then you wouldn't, like, you, then you need to have the, this compiler language to tell the transistor what to do. But in principle, if you just want to do addition, just a written paper, yeah. addition, you wouldn't need uh, um, a programming language. Yes. So, principle. so how how do you tell the transistors what to do by putting electricity in a certain circuit? You know, you can't tell them do this, but you just put yeah, electricity, yeah, yeah. and then they do what what this circuit does, just as a pattern, does it? And so, if you want to have addition and you have an adder, then you have to put electricity on this circuit in a certain rhythm. And that's what the clock of the computer does. It gives the rhythm of the pulses of the electrons, and then they move in this rhythm through the circuit, and then, then the calculation is automatically performed. And this is a deterministic device. It can't, it can only do that. It will always do that, you know. It's fascinating. And and, and the idea that, that was an Englishman for a change, Charles Babbitt, he was the first to have this idea that you can set up such deterministic, you know, circuits. He did and he designed it to be mechanical. Right, so his idea was to do this in a me mechanical way, but but the gates were the same. So they were just realized not with electricity, but mechanically. And and so and so even Leibniz had already thought that the machine could be built um, based on this principle. And so it's 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 not one once you understand it's not so hard, you know. And yes, you don't need all this overhead if you at the very first Conrad II's very first models, they were just um, taking mechanical points. So he was simulating the Z3, he was throwing in points. The coins were dropping in slots, and then the machinery of adding was performed. And he had several slots indicating the value of the digit he wanted to add. He threw in two coins, and then they got added. You know? and, and all this was mechanically re realized. And the there was no compiler. It was just the, the order was given by dropping the slots into the coins, the coins into the slots. And, but, but, but ultimately, it's still the same. It's just that now there's so many the circuits, there's so many micro uh, micro circuits um, and, and so many uh, millions of um, of, uh, of of gates that are added, but that's basically how it works. So the, the story about ChatGPT uh, is told according to which, if they just printed out the next most likely syllable, then you would get too much repetition. And so to avoid repetition, they add a little spot of indeterminacy or randomness to the output. How do you get randomness if everything is going to ah, it's, it's very, it's very simple that you somewhere in the circuit, you are, you, so you build a random generator. There are many ways to build a random generator. The best ones are using actual radioactivity, but there are also other ways to build a random generator. You can also do it with software so that you can make circuits that produce random numbers. They are not as perfect. So if you, if you analyze the output over long periods of time, you can find patterns. But if you only look at a few outputs, they create quite, they, they actually simulate randomness quite well. And so then you basically somewhere in the circuit, you put in the randomness. So, so in, the, in ChatGPT, the randomness is, is created um, uh, by altering the, I think, but nobody knows. But I think the, the most likely way it, I think it works is that the input is slightly modified every time. And then the model itself, the, the, the core GPT-4 model is totally deterministic, but if you slightly add, change this input, of course, it will create different outputs. That's why, that's why when you give the same input to ChatGPT several times, you get different answers. But I think if you do it over a long period, very long period of time, you will also see a pattern arising. So, 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 so how can it be that, that an algorithm that, that does something like ChatGPT is ultimately running on such a computer architecture. Well, that's because ChatGPT is quote unquote merely a very long equation. It's a very long computable equation, and it takes a certain input, 
and then the values of the symbols of the letters that are input are transformed into numbers. The numbers are plugged into the big equation. Then the equation is computed um, using using um, using um, the regular CPU or GPU. I think it's a regular CPU for for the operation of the equation. Um, it's 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 just computed like like this, you know. So it's it's just a deterministic equation. It's a stochastic model. But once the equation is set up, it's just a deterministic equation running on a normal Turing machine, universal Turing machine. Do you have a question? Yeah. So in the case in which uh, the machine will compute uh, uh, an output that seems random, what is really happening is that it's compressible into a, a function that is machine code that point in point by point. Right? Yeah. So it it is also random generated as a Turing function, right? Unless it's a real random, so sometimes you need a real randomness. Then you use quantum, then use uh, use quantum physics, so use uh, radioactive decay. And radioactive decay gives you a true random pattern. And so if you look up uh, random generator, random number generator on Wikipedia, you find all the different concepts. And also, as the holy grail of random number generation, of course, radioactive decay, because that's a true random phenomenon. So if you really need that, then you use it and transform the signals given out by the physical random generator into into electron into put it into such a circuit. Then you have a true random element. And and random so computation with randomness is very important. So by by doing computation with randomness on conventional computers, you can be you can actually get um, polynomial approximation to quantum computers for many many problems. That's why why there's so little left to do for quantum computers. Because now they have managed to find so many clever ways of using conventional computers to do things that thought that the, where, where it was thought at the beginning of quantum computing that there's a big difference between the conventional computer and the quantum computer. Now this has shrunk, and and that's because because for example by introducing randomness into into conventional computing, you can you can eat up some of the advantages of quantum computing. Okay, so so I think this is pretty satisfying, isn't it? Because now you know basically how this works. And you, I think as a philosopher, you don't have to know at all how certain special circuits are now set up to do something. It's just to know now how simple it is. You know, you just put electricity uh, on this part and this part and this part, then you get automatically, you get the addition. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite nice. And it all works because of, uh, of the Boolean logic. That was an Englishman too, by the way, who defined it first. Boolean? Yes, Boolean. Iron. Yeah, an iron, sorry, a Brit, a Brit. <laughs> Like you call yeah. <laughs> okay. I give up. <laughs> it's so complicated. So, um, so this is this is all I wanted to tell you about computation. I, I didn't do it last time, but I think it was important because it really, really clearly shows you what is going on. Okay. Now to understand quantum computing. So, until when do we have this morning, Barry? Till um, twelve. Till twelve. So, and when do we have the first? So let me double check. So so anyhow, so so we so I want to explain to you how quantum computers work. And I think you can you will be after that you will be able to understand it at the level we just understood uh, classical computers. I think which would be already quite a lot, quite do you some good. So let's start. So but to do this, we have to start with quantum mechanics. So so I it's still one o'clock. Till one o'clock. So we do the first break yeah. at eleven. For 15 minutes and then then we, we, yeah, we do the rest. Still 12 tomorrow. Okay. So so um I will try to not do I to do as little mathematics as possible, but I have to introduce some mathematical concepts. So a very, very important phenomenon is is a wave. Because the Schrödinger equation is a wave equation. So you need to we need to go through a bit little bit of mathematics and physics. So if you have here um two pure sound waves one with uh, frequency cosinus 10 pi t and the other one with cosinus 8 pi t you will get a superposition and if you so if you have two chords of of an instrument that you that you um uh how do you say this that you stimulate to make a sound like on a piano you, ultimately you have hammers hitting on chords right yeah, but that's it. Yeah, but stimulate. But I don't even know what the right unzupfen, what the right English word for this is. But anyhow, hit. yeah, hit. You just hit one. Right? Hit. Yeah. So, so if you hit on the piano two chords of pure, um, they are not. But if they were of pure frequency, then you would have you get superposition. And so what is what is happening is 
that that because they, this one is 10, this is 10 to 8, and so so you get then the superposition of them. So they add up, but here they cancel each other out because this here you see is positive and this one is negative. So they cancel each other out so that you don't get much signal here. And then they start to add up again. Here they are both positive and they are in sync. And so they get high signal here, they are slightly out of sync, so you get less signal. You understand the, the way it, it works, right? It's just adding up the frequency. So, so at every and so by doing this, you now get beats. So this creates beats. When you hear beats in music, they are created like this. And um, so this is this is just just to remind you of waves, okay? And um, now let's look at the classical. One of the experiments that um, that uh, led to the discovery of quantum mechanics. So imagine that you have a um, a gun here um, that that um, is shooting particles um, on a wall that has two slits, and um, if you uh, if you um, shoot the bullets and now measure here, you have a detector to measure where they arrive, um, and you have one slit closed, then you get, of course, this distribution because you get most bullets hit here and then less here and less here because of the way they move through the slit. So the slit determines this pattern. And so here you have very few and the most are here, more or less right behind the slit. And the same is true for the second slit. So this is what you see when you basically have one of the slits closed. Now, if you open both slits um, and you have these bullets, um, then you will get just an addition of the two waves as a pattern, right? And this is, uh, this is called, um, so the probability distribution of detecting P12 uh, bullets fired against the wall with two slits equals the sum of the probabilities measured in each slit, just the sum of the two distributions. Now, if you have a water source here, now you tap into the water regularly with a small hammer, you will, you will get this undulation of the bottle water waves. And now you have two slits again and a detector here. Now you see something fascinating. If you, if you close one slit, you get this pattern or this pattern, which is the same as the pattern you get with the bullets. But if you open both slits, you get what is called interference. This interference is like the interference I've shown here. Yeah, so they so they they add up and create a pattern that it doesn't look at all like just adding up the two probabilities because they they sometimes cancel each other out and so on. So they create this strange pattern. And so so for wave source, you measure interaction of the wave pattern resulting in an interference pattern with the wave, with a different wave intensity. So it's just not the sum, but it's actually the sum um, of the of the um, absolute. And um, and if you if you calculate this out, you get according to trigonometry, you get this. So here the angle um, between the two waves is, is so, so to speak, determining one of the terms and, and so on. So the delta is the phase difference between the two waves, right? So here it was eight to 10, the phase difference. And that, that's what creates the interference. And um, now, um, so this is just not yet quantum mechanics, it's just to remind you what's happening when you have wave interference. Now, um, we have the first, now let's go through the principles of quantum mechanics. The first principle is that the probability that a particle starting at S arrives at X is the square of its amplitude. The amplitude is written like this. So this particle S should arrive at X and this is written like this. And, and it's just a complex number if you calculate it. And um, so, so, and so if you take this value and square its absolute, then you get the probability. And the value itself is just called the amplitude. It's called the probability amplitude. It's a bit irritating. That has historical reason why it's called amplitude, but it's not. It's it's only the likeliness that S um, uh, will arrive at X. And, and so just one important thing, for quantum mechanics, you also need to understand um, imaginary numbers. So this is a Gauss imaginary number space. You see it has a real axis and it has an imaginary axis and doing that you can represent square root of minus one. And, and so here you have the coordinates on the real axis and the point C is, is X, so that's this, plus the imaginary number times Y. 
This gives you the coordinates in this Gaussian imaginary number sphere. And um, was it Euler? Yeah, I think Euler didn't present it like this, but, but he implicitly used it and Gauss formalized it. And uh, Euler was a Swiss guy, by the way. And, um, and, uh, um, and this is the complement. So if you exchange the plus sign here on this y-axis by a minus sign, then you get the complement. And we will use the complement all the time later on. So you just can imagine that the complement of an irrational, of an, of, uh, um, of, um, of an imaginary number, so that's called Z, is called an imaginary number. Its complement is, uh, is, um, uh, is this Z uh, with the bar. And, and uh, I is just equals square of minus one. So that's how you can imagine the small i. Square root of minus one. Okay. So, so okay, you're right. I'm, um, I still don't know what amplitude is. Amplitude is just um, the the um, kind of the relationship. This term, the Dirac term, x bar s, it's called bracket s x, uh, x s, bracket, bra x cat s. This bracket just means the likelihood that s arrives at point x. And we will see it in, on the next slides. I, there's a good explanation. You will just see it graphically. So, so, but before we go back to this bracket notation, we look at Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So everybody here has heard of the uncertainty principle, right? And I want, there's an explanation of the uncertainty principle that you can understand without mathematics, almost without mathematics. And I want to, I want to um, show this to you because, because um, later on with quantum computers, we also see how important it is to understand the uncertainty principle. So, so suppose we have a single slit and particles are coming from very far away with a certain energy. So, so coming far away, it means that they, they have the, essentially the same energy and that they are horizontal. So they all have a, a horizontal momentum P0 in the classical sense. Classical, when that's from Richard Feynman, when he says classically, he always means classical physics, not classical music. Um, <laughs> and and uh, so the particle is moving neither up or down because it came from a very, very fast source. So the whole vertical momentum is lost. Right, so it's now only moving horizontally. This is, by the way, one one of these instances of what called Nancy Cartwright calls physics as theater. Right, so you prepare, you make, you want to make a statement in physics. Now you tell a long story that justifies your assumptions. That's the theater, and then ta-da, you have the great thing evolving, you know. And so, so it it doesn't move up or down; it just moves from left to right. Now the particle comes comes out through the hole. We know the position vertically, it's, it's only in the range of B because B is the size of the slit. And now the uncertainty of its vertical position is in the order of, of B, uh, delta Y. So, and now um, we might want to say, since we know the momentum is absolutely horizontal, um, we might think that Delta P Y is zero, but that is wrong. And why is this wrong? Well, we once knew that the momentum was horizontal, but we don't know it anymore. Because before the particles passed through the hole, we did not know their vertical positions. Now that we have found the vertical po position by having the particle come through the hole, we have lost our information on the vertical momentum. Um, and because according to the wave theory, there is a diffraction of the wave as they go through the slits, just as for light. Therefore, this pattern is spread out by the diffraction effect. Well, the diffraction means that particles can hit here and then they get, like it was shown here, you know, they can rebound like this from the corners of the slit. And so this means that, that we basically we are losing the information about their vertical position. That's super interesting, right? So the spreading out through this, and this is, by the way, this is from a dialogue between Einstein and I don't know Niels Bohr. So it was some of the great theoreticians was contradicting to the to the to the um, 
to the um, uncertainty principle of Heisenberg. I think it was Niels Bohr. And then Einstein came up, came up with this. And it's very funny because they, they walked to really the park in Berlin or somewhere and he explained it to him like this with the slip and with losing the information. It, it really, and then later he, he wrote a letter to him again. And we still have this letter. And so Feynman uses this letter and he just uses, and he also describes, it is so great how Einstein was thinking that, that he just, you know, the other one was challenging him, but he just came up with this experiment and it's just, it's so beautiful, you know. So, um, so now we have lost information about, about the vertical um, uh, um, momentum. So you know what momentum is, right? So momentum is, is mass times, uh, times um, uh, velocity. So it means that, that um, uh, it, determines, it determines how hard this bottle will, will hit against this object, for example, this, and then it will pass on some momentum to this microphone and so on, right? That, that's momentum. And, and so the momentum is lost. And um, now, um, we can detect this diffraction with the particle count, and when the counter receives the particle, say here, um, the particle has a vertical momentum in order to get from the split up to Z. So the vertical momentum PY has a spread which is equal to P0 times delta theta, where P0 is a horizontal momentum. That's just trigonometry. And now you can, can calculate how big the spread out pattern is. It's delta PY equals P0 times lambda divided by B. And so um, where lambda is the wavelength. And if we make B smaller and make a more accurate measurement of the position of the particle by making the slit smaller, the diffraction pattern gets wider because if B is below one, then of course, in, because it's in the denominator, then the whole expression gets bigger. So the narrower we make the slit, the wider the pattern gets and the more the likelihood that we would find the particle has sidewise momentum. Thus the uncertainty in the vertical momentum is inversely proportional to the uncertainty of Y. And in accordance to, to quantum mechanics, the wavelength times momentum is a Planck constant. So we obtain the rule that the uncertainty in the vertical momentum and in the vertical position have a product of the order of the Planck constant. So, so if you multiply this, so this is the, the uncertainty expressed as a product, and, and this is greater or equal to the Planck constant divided by two. And so this principle is always valid in quantum experiments, no matter which mutually related properties of a particle are measured. And so this will be very important for quantum computers later on because it actually means that if you have a quantum bit, which is the equivalent of the bit, so here we saw that is a bit, right? That's an input bit, that's another input bit, that's an output bit, and so on. We will have some similar bits in quantum computers, and they are called quantum bits, and together they such operators here that operate on bits and create output are called quantum gates and not any more logic gates, they're called quantum gates. These are obviously called logic gates because they operate according to the rules of proposition logic. And in quantum mechanics, um, they, they will be called quantum gates. And, and of course, when we have an output here, we want to know what it is, we measure it. When, when something comes a bit after quantum computation, we want to measure a bit. And then when we measure it, we can always only get a zero and a one, nothing else. And, and we will later on see why this is the case and what this has to do with the uncertainty principle. But now I derive the uncertainty principle for you. And, and um, I think it's a, this was Einstein's way of doing it. There are many, many other ways to derive the uncertainty principle, and it applies in many places in quantum physics, but this is the simplest one, and it was made by Einstein. It's funny because Einstein on a walk made a contribution to quantum mechanics. <laughs> it's, it's quite a cool story. It shows how he thought, you know, and, and I think he, he also made with the EPR paradoxon, he made the most deep statement about quantum mechanics a uh, 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 physicist ever made. Though Einstein wasn't participating in inventing quantum mechanics, he was witnessing it for decades, you know. I mean, Schrödinger came out with the equation in 26, Einstein died in 55, and so, and so um, he was, for 30 years, he was commenting on it, and he made the observation that quantum mechanics is incomplete, and we will get back to this. So, now, let's look at what, so now we've understood quantum mechanics, the principle of uncertainty without understanding. Are there questions to this? Can okay. you explain us what Y is? Because you introduce it on this slide, but you don't say what Y is. Uh, so Y is just the, um, the, the vertical place. So, so this, is, this, is the, this is the vertical place and this is the vertical momentum. Right. Anyway, now we know what Y is. Yeah, sorry. It, 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 it's, a, it's, it's an imperfection of the slides due to, yeah. because I was, when I wrote this, so in this that I, 
And it's so clear always in physics when you just have the letters X, Y, and Z, it's just location, right? So, um, and this is, this is, so this is location, this is a momentum. And um, uh, yeah, so it's, I say it here, vertical momentum. And so this is vertical yeah. momentum, this is vertical position. Good. Now, um, now the double, so now we don't have, a, so this here was a gun with small bullets, like a, classic, like a classic gun, but tiny bullets may be made of aluminum. Now we have a gun that shoots electrons. And so, so um, we have again a wall with two slits. We have the detector, we have a with the backstop. And then now we measure, we close slit two and we measure and we get this pattern. And we do the inverse, close this, and we get this pattern. Okay. So now the, the, the electron gun behaves like a particle because you measure the pattern that you would measure with small aluminum bullets. Now, if you open both slits, it looks like a wave because we don't obtain this anymore, but we obtain the pattern like with a wave. But wait a minute, we have shot, we shot particles with the electron gun. We can create such a gun, right? And we shot particles, but we measure a wave. So this was, when this was observed for the first time, they were almost desperate. They couldn't believe it. And, and, and um, I made this joke already last September once. The Germans could, everything of, all of this was in Germany. Every, there was only one quantum um, physicist who was working in Germany, but not a German, a major one. And there was another French one. Iraq was a French one. Der Boer was a Danish one. All the others were Germans. So the Germans could figure, still figure this out. But for the general theory of relativity, they needed a Jew. <laughs> but this they could figure out because they could use their classical physics. And so, so when electrons with classical physics regard as particles are fired against the wall, the probability of detecting um, uh, the electrons which wants to close is just this, but the probability distribution is not the sum of the two detected intensities as with the bullets, but instead the pattern looks like a in wave interference pattern, which you remember has this equation with the cosine term here, right? And so, and so, um, so it seems that the electrons be like, behave like particles with only one slit, but like wave with both. This was the second important experiment which could not be explained using classical physics. Now, um, Now let's go to the second principle. When an event can occur in several alternative ways, the probability amplitude for the event is the sum of the probability amplitude for each way considered separately. So, so this is, this is um, uh, both holds open is this amplitude plus this amplitude, but you have to, you have to square this. So this is interference. And um, yeah, so here you see it again. Uh, so I don't know why I have two slides here, but this is this is just showing this that 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 uh, if you close the slits now now both slits are open now you get this pattern and this is computed like this ah and now we we also start to understand so Barry now you understand this notation so you see this is um, the likelihood of of getting from S which is here to X which is here. So this is the Dirac notation. It just describes the likelihood. And so, and so now what you can see also what is very important is that you have to add this likelihood to go through one from S to one to X to the likelihood to go from S to two to X and then square it, right? And um, if an experiment is performed which is capable of determining whether one or another alternative is actually taken, the probabilities of the event is the sum of the probabilities for each alternative. The interference is lost, right? So here, if you if you close one of the slits, you can you can you can lose the, you lose the interference. Now we see here again, if you have now several two slits, this is super important to understand quantum mechanics. Now we want to understand the likelihood of going from S to detector X, and we have put here two walls. So now we have we want to, we have first to see, um, we have the possibility of going from S to one, then from one to A, and then from A to X. That's one pass to go from, from S to X. Then we have the next pass, which goes from S to one, then to B, then to X. And then we have the next one, which goes from, it's not shown here, which goes from S to one, from one to C, and from C to X. And so you see, 
Now you can write this in an elegant way with a, with a, with a, with a sum sign, summing over the, the two holes in the first wall and then the three holes in the second wall. And then you can see, you can put, now you put in all the combinations. So, and if you do this, so you put E for one and then you put, um, so you have a one here and a one here. And now you put A for alpha and then B for alpha and then C for alpha. You get the three first possibilities. And then you do it and then you get all the possibilities of going through this. And so you have to find the probability of going from S to X. You have to, um, you have to um, identify um, uh, all the combinations and sum them up, right? And this is, and this is basically what, what also happens in quantum computers in a way. So, so quantum computers, and if you look at advanced quantum mechanics, then you have an integral here. Because then you're not anymore looking at discrete paths, but you're looking at a continuum. Right, but the beauty is I can save you from the integral today because quantum computing doesn't need the integral. Quantum computing is this artificial world, an artificial machine that that only looks at discrete states, like we do it here. So this is a super. Do you understand this? Do you understand this slide? Not the quantum computer stuff. You just did. I was engaging because we did in the last, so I understand. I just didn't understand the last part. Yeah, the, you will see this is just a preview. You will understand that. But do you understand this first part that, that, that you have to add all the different paths together to get the total probability, right? Mm -hmm. And and so this is this is this is what is done. And and you will encounter this notation very often now. So now you see the explanation of the Dirac Dirac notation. This is one explanation. The real one is with a, with a complicated integral, but but this is what I showed last September, but I won't show it show it here because it makes no sense. We would lose too much time. So so um, how do we calculate the amplitude that we square to get the probability? So if you have these two locations, R1 and R2, and the particle move from R1 and R2 has wave-like properties, the amplitude propagating as a wave with a wave number equal to the momentum divided by H. So this is basically, um, this this shows you how to calculate this probability. So you you, you take the exponential function. You have the the uh, e from the unreal from the um, uh, 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 complex numbers. You have um, you have um, momentum. Uh, you have the distance. You divide it by the Planck constant, and then you normalize it by this distance. And this is the probability of moving from R1 to R2 expressed in, a, in an amplitude. So that's a proper amplitude. And you can see why amplitude comes from, because that is like what you get when you decompose sine and cosine into the exponential function, you get this exponential expression. So, so remember the Euler equation? Do you all know the Euler equation? It just shows you how you can decompose sine and cosine into, into the exponential function. And so basically, this is just exponential function style of expression of the sine curve. So that's why it's the amplitude because it, and it depends of course on the momentum. So, so, so if you have a lot of momentum, the amplitude will be higher, right? And then you will, and then, and, and, and then, and, and then this value becomes higher and then you have a higher likelihood of coming from R1 to R2 with a higher amplitude. Um, and so, and so this, is the, and this is the way, um, uh, it's a classical relationship between um, between the momentum and uh, and mass, which is the kinetic energy. Now, now comes the next super interesting experiment. So this experiment was done already uh, in the 19th century, but for a very long time, nobody could explain it at all. And then there was another experiment. And now I'm skipping Max Planck's contribution, which was, which was, um, uh, which was the quantization of electrons, which was the beginning of quantum mechanics in 1905. But I'm skipping this because we, can't, we don't have the time here. And I'm jumping ahead. So, so I need to say this. So Max Planck has discovered that the electrons are not situated around the nucleus in an atom in a continuous way, but that they are, have probability um, levels which are fixed. These are the probability levels of the electron. And if you look at the modern electron model or an atom model, you know it's like this, that you have that you have different levels at which the electrons can be. There's a lithium or atom with three electrons and three protons. And they, they can be at, at different levels of, of distance from, from, the, from the nucleus. And if they're more away from the distance, they have higher energy levels. 
and Planck discovered that when an electron drops down, then a certain quantum of energy light is emitted. And that this light is proportional not to a discontinuous function, but to a discrete function, quantum, a quantum of energy, not a continuous variable. And Jeet and Rayleigh, two great British physicists, had described a law that would use a continuous function. And it didn't work. It, it was incompatible with, with reality. And so Planck looked at this experiment again, and by great inner pain, as he wrote to a friend, he had to accept there as a continuous, a non-continuous value in nature. It was terrible because basically physics always assumed that everything is continuous, like the laws of Newton, you know, laws of motion. And that, that, that there is now suddenly a discrete amount that is there. That was all that's why it's called quantum, because there's a quantum of energy levels that are different. So so this was already known. But and there were some, you know, Einstein had also worked on the on the problem with uh, with his um, uh, model of particle motion. So there was already some stuff was done, but but quantum mechanics was still not really kickstarted. You know, though Planck had already invented the electron quantization in 1905, there was no quantum mechanical equations, but the one that he had invented. Now, Stern and Gallagher in Frankfurt at the University of Frankfurt, they made an experiment. Um, where they, they had an oven that could create silver atoms. So with a lot of heat, they could evaporate the silver atoms and then, then the silver atoms could move like this through a hole. And uh, with a, with inside a vacuum, of course, so that they would not be disturbed. And then there was a big magnet with a strong flux upwards. The flux is made by making the magnet like this. And then, you know, um, uh, um, and the English from electromagnetism had, had um, what's wrong with me this morning? So anyhow, um, there were already the, the, the laws of electromagnetism allow you to build such a magnet that has a, a strong magnetic field upwards because of the shape of the magnet. And so, the lab, sorry, the yeah, Maxwell. Thank you. Ma Maxwell's, Maxwell's equations allow you to to construct this this magnet. And and so and so then they had a glass plate and the, the the silver atoms were flying through this magnetic field. And and um, then they detected the deposits of the silver from this beam on the glass plate. And they expected to have a smear, the one I have indicated here in red. So classical physics with a continuous vertical component of, of the angular momentum would lead to a vertical smear, but they observed two points. They were shocked. They were shocked, you know, because because they thought that angular momentum. So why is why are the why are the silver atoms at all distorted by the magnetic field? Well, because they have angular momentum themselves, they act like small magnets, and so there are some. That's also why in iron you can have a man. If you put a magnet against iron, the iron bar becomes a magnet itself because all the 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 uh, the atoms the iron atoms have themselves they have themselves tiny magnets and they all arrange themselves in the same way so that you that then then they become like a magnet you know every child knows it and and so <clears throat> and so um so they saw that 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 the that this property this pro property of being a small magnet which is called angular momentum um uh would would be continuous but it was and th then somebody realized that this was like with the quantization of the electrons in Planck's equation, right? And so, so they said, oh, this, this property that makes the silver atoms like magnets must also be discrete, like the electrons are discrete. So they discovered this. And, and then they, they called this property the spin. And, um, and um, spin is is um, is a is a property um, of of uh, particles that lets them behave in a certain way in a magnetic field. What is spin in German? Spin. There is no translation. And and um, so yeah, it may be. What do you think they meant? So I show you. Let's take the, I need the English page, but my browser is set in a way to always show the German way one first, but we'll go to the English now. So 
They call it an intrinsic form of angular momentum carried by elementary particles and thus by composite particles such as blah, 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 and atoms. Spin of one of the two types of angular momentum in quantum mechanics, the other being orbital angular momentum. The orbital angular momentum operates as well, you don't need to. So basically, the spin is, it says the existence of electron spin in angular momentum is inferred from experiments such as the Galar experiment. But that's all we know about spin. Right? So we have a mathematical model of spin, we call it angular momentum, but that's only because it's an analogy to classical physics. But as Feynman says, we don't know what spin is. We can't imagine it. Yeah? We, just have, we just have a mathematical model of it, which, which is super accurate, but we don't know what it really is. It is what makes the electrons or the atoms fly in a certain way in the magnetic field. That's all. But how it works, we don't know. We can't imagine it, actually. You know, all the geometrical analog, analoga we have are wrong. There is no way to use our common sense view of the world to measure what spin is. Spin is just this, the behavior of the particles in the magnetic field. And this is, this is fine. This, and this, when I, when I realized this very, really, that was the idea for our paper. You know, when I realized that nobody can explain what spin really is. Then I phoned my uncle who was theoretical physicist, I asked him what a spin is, he said exactly this. Oh, I don't know, nobody knows. So, this is, this is great, I think. So, anyhow, let's continue here. Um, do I still present the presentation on the screen? Can you check? Is it still visible in the Google Meet? Yeah. Good. And so now um, you can, with this here, indicate the strong magnetic field in one direction, this, this um, how is it called, um, uh, flux. And uh, which is called, uh, um, this is the NAPLA operator that, that is used to describe such a field in, in physics. We don't have to look at it. And to, here you see now a different type of atom that is split into three beams. So this is, so um, silver is split into two, but atoms of spin one are split into three beams. And oh, let me look up. So just for completeness, what atom is, has spin through one. Um, uh anyhow i um the, the particles are divided into those which have spin one and spin half and so on uh, yeah, yes yes please and <laughs> and um and so but there are atoms which have spin one and they can be and they can be um split into three beams and now if you see here, now we can imagine a different stern galler apparatus, which has here inversion of the magnetic pole. So first it has north-south, so the flux, and then the flux goes into the other direction, and then it goes back to this direction. So we are changing the direction of the flux in this experiment. And now you see that in the first apparatus, we split the, um, we split the beam into three, and then we can put it together again in this apparatus, and then, um, uh, and then uh, change it in this apparatus and then put it together again here. So, and um, now you can, you can imagine to put several such machines which are able to split and unify the beam. So this splits and unifies the beam. Now you can imagine that you put several of these um, uh, in, in series, but you can now put in a filter. For example, for example, when you put, you have the first of these, Apparat machines with a filter that filters out the minus and the and the and the negative and the zero spin beams of the of the of the split beam. You only get this, and then if you put the second in here, only the plus will arrive, right? And so and so now you can develop a kind of you know an alphabet to describe these machines. So this would be a machine that splits and reassembles. This, the atom beam. This would one that splits it and reassembles it, but that filters out the zero and minus. This one filters out plus and minus, this one filters out plus and zero. And now you can say, um, you can calculate the amplitude to pass the various combinations of pure filters, and you can express them in matrix notation. So here, this is the start state, this is the end state, and now you want to know the likelihood of starting in plus s and ending up in plus s. So this would be we put um, we put um, these two filters here in a row, and then determine the likelihood that the iron the, the this beam the plus beam is ending here. So there would be a second filter here, 
And that's of course one. Why is it one? Because, because now after this filter, I only have pl spin plus atoms left. And when they go through the second apparatus, they are not hitting any obstacle, right? Or even if there would be an obstacle here, they get through. And so now you can have a matrix telling you the likelihood to pass from through such a filter machine. So for example, the likelihood to get from minus S to plus S is, uh, is zero, and the likelihood from zero S to plus S also. So you can only get with such a symmetric apparatus, you can only get from plus S, from the same S to the same S. And you can also rotate the filters um, uh, and see, put, put the, the Stern Gala filters in series, and then you get even other probabilities for the particles to pass through the filters. And um, so now you can written, you can write, you have this matrix that, that describes how the particles go through the filter. And now you can express this um, in terms of the, the likelihood of a particle to go from one state to another state. And these states are now, and now remember that we had the sum already here, right? This is a sum of going through both filters, or this was the sum, no, I meant this one, this sum of going with a certain path through both of the filters, right? And now we can apply it to these types of filters as well. And now we can say, so um, I have a certain, I go, I have, I have now, let's say, um, my three holes. And so now I have the probability of going from three to hole one and from hole one to he, and then hole two and hole three. And if I have three holes, then I will have all the possibilities. And, and, um, and, and this, is, this is basically represented also as a matrix. So we said that with the filters we just saw, we can only get from the same S to the same S which means that only that in this matrix, when rho and column are unequal, you have zero probability. And when rho and column have this, are the same, we have one probability one, right? And so this is called the Kronecker Delta. So the Kronecker Delta just says that you can only get a one in the matrix if J and I are equal, which so row, row one and column one, row two and column two, row three and column three. And that gives you the probabilities of going through the filter system. And here we have an example, um, a workout example of this going going through this uh, through this type of filter, and um, and this uses the, the I think it's too complicated for today, but this uses the turned around filter that we had here, and and to model the turned around filter, you need to calculate the complement. Um, uh, so you so when you square, when you want to know the the probability of going from plus s to plus t, you need to you need and to square this. You you need to multiply the probability with its complement. The complement was this, which we saw here. You can also it's also often expressed with a star. So you need the complement where when you have a matrix complement, you it's a star. And so so this shows you that you need this complement. And now. Basically, what we can see is that if this is supposed to be true, now you can calculate this, multiply this out, right? Mm -hmm. You can say this uh, is this plus this plus this. So these are the three possibilities, um, S to plus T, S to zero T, S to minus T, and they all have to add up to one. And at the same time, um, this also has up this here the part that without the trend the, without the inversion also has to add up to one this is and so the, these two equations are only consistent for all relative orientations of the t and the s apparatuses if we have these law if if the if the um inverse of um if all these inverts are true and so that means that actually this amplitude is always equal to the exchange amplitude um, of um, uh, inverted. And so, so these are basically, using the, the filters, the fundamental laws of quantum mechanics derived. So the first one is the Kronecker delta, that, with the, with that basically only the ones in the matrix uh, only the probabilities, so that, that only these amplitudes are one. 
Then the next one is that to get this probability, you need to add up all the paths through the filters. And the third one says that um, that uh, the inverse of uh, this um, bracket is is the same as the when when you when you exchange the two target and uh, the two the two um, yeah the two locations. Thank you and build the inverse. It's the same then without exchanging. And so these and so you can derive those three laws of quantum mechanics from the filter from the filter experiments. And 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 I think this is quite elegant and relatively simple to understand. And you can read it read it up in the third volume of of Feynman. I think it's chapter five, in the third volume of his um, uh, physics uh, Feynman lectures on physics. You can get it online. So if you if you go to Feynman lectures on physics, you Google that, you come to a page at Caltech where he gave the lectures in the sixties, and there all the lectures are beautifully for free. You can look at them. They they are really well. Very well set up, and chapter five explains all of this. And but but basically, um, so I now very quickly. It takes a bit longer to do it properly, but very quickly I showed you these are the three fundamental laws, and this means I will do this a bit later. But 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 one very important aspect is the following. So if this is the location of a particle, and these are basic n basic locations. For example, in the three-dimensional space with three dimensions, you can express one of the locations um, or the, one of the amplitudes um, as a linear as a linear combination of the basis states. So, you take a complex number, number one, you multiply it by the first component, the second one by the second component, the third by the third component. You add them up, and that gives you this number. So, and this is what this also shows. So. When you want to go from the, the have the amplitude of going from that location to that location, basically you express each of the lo two locations in the base in the base dimensions, and that's in the coordinate system of two coordinates. That's just like saying uh, this here, this this vector is just a combination of x and y. So so this is just z is just equals alpha y plus x. Right, and this is so. This is basically what is done here. So you are basically expressing um, a certain uh, particle location as a linear combination, or some other property, as a linear combination um, of of the basic coordinates. Right. So, so we could. This is a one times x. So therefore, there is no there is no parameter here. But this is alpha y. So there's a there would be a parameter. And 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 so. These complex numbers are just the parameters to express um, the location or the quantum property expressed by this uh, 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 cat um, using. Um, so, oh, by the way, why is it called bra cat? Because um, because these are brackets, right? These two are brackets, and then they call this one a bra and this one a cat. And at this time, sexism was still en vogue. You know, they were not woke yet. So they were allowed to call it a bra, and nowadays it's still called a bra. And it's interesting. Um, uh, and I've uh, this is no joke. I told this to my sister. She works in the cultural area. She runs a Goethe Institute, and she told me. She, and I asked her to ask um, a, a gender professor at the Faculty of Mathematics or Physics, and she tries to get rid of the bra because she believes it's sexist. So that's how we, where we've gotten. But when the bracket notation was it was invented, you know. The man invented who invented was was Dirac, and and she just said, you know, these are brackets. I call this bra. This cat. He was a Frenchman, so they invented the bra. You know, what do you expect? So 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 that that's how it came about. So so um, so this is so now we have we have gone through um, uh, the very basics of quantum mechanics and uh, using the filters. And um, are there any questions to this? It's a bit of mathematics, but not very complicated. Yeah, so there's a lot going on. Yeah, so I think I think the best for you to do is to is to um, is to read this chapter and find I don't I don't have the the time. So you can also watch the video. He's quite. Busy. Yes. So so the, yes. So he's very in the best sense very Jewish. He's great, and and he he is um, so the the the. Um, 
for each, if you go to this web page, for each, um, for each printed lecture, there's also a video that you can watch. And he said it really well, it's very fun. And, and so anyhow, um, but, but what you can take from this is that this filtering allows you the passing of the, of the beams of particles through the filter allows you to derive the basic laws of quantum mechanics. And that what was, that's what was actually done in, in a way, you know, that they use these types of experiments to derive the basic laws of quantum mechanics only that it didn't happen in the order that is presented in the book by Feynman. So Feynman, to explain it easily, he then invented a new order in which it was, of course, not done in practice. But you know, that's normal. So if you look at um, Weierstrass, so when Weierstrass um, uh, started to systematize mathematics, he also invented a new order, how each mathematical proof is based on, on the basic axioms of Peano. And, and of course, he dis discarded the way that mathematics had evolved. He replaced it by an artificial evolution of, of mathematics. That is now the way mathematics is, is taught in every textbook. But when he did it, he had to reorder everything to make it more plausible in the way it evolves. And, and, um, and so this is how Feynman does it as well. But basically, it's always about can the particle reach another, an, another position? And what do I have to do to calculate this? And this way, you get to these basic laws. I think before we do a bit more of, we, are, we are, will finish the quantum mechanics part today, I promise so that we can maybe do a bit of quantum computers already today or the rest tomorrow. So now we do, um, we do a, how many, how much break, 10 minutes, Barry? Yeah, break. Yes, how many minutes? Uh, 10 minutes. Good. Yeah. We'll see you at five past 11. Then you, you have more words for your um, English pronunciation than Catherine. Some of them would think so. Yeah, I'm going to take Point out that you've been setting up on the screen, which then runs across to the logic. But that's after the other day, does or you know, the same guy. I'm sorry, 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 but it's not, 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 it's not,
in Python. Because shards, like many, many people forget about what quantum computers consist of, he seems to think that you can just have a bit, it's, the qubit is just like a bit. Because when you measure it, you only get a zero or a one. But the problem is that physically, that for, for each qubit, infinitely many possibilities it has. And when, the, and when we have several qubits chained together, you have, a, you have a superposition pattern, like the one I showed at the beginning, of all these single qubits. And, and so the wave is super complex. And I think the illusion of quantum computing is that you think that you can technically control, control them. You know, but I think it's not possible to technically control them properly because the complexity of the quantum wave is too high because the quantum wave is continuous. And the bits, but the bits in the, in the 64 bit computer, they are from a continuous, they are regular. And they are always in the defined state. And yeah. each of these is has infinite and infinite number of states. Yeah. Because that's what the equation shows, especially the one, the one the bottom side, you can suppose your theta divided by two times cat zero plus a who feeds sine theta divided by two times and cat zero here means cat zero and cat one are the base state. They're shown the sphere oh, okay. right. as the extremes. Okay. They're locations. They're just locations. But of course, how do you know where the base states are as it were oh so you should we have to put the computer in the base so if you have a quantum register of eight qubits for example pull it down to zero kelvin yeah and you, then you hope that they all settle yeah. at, at zero and then you shoot lasers against them or apply heat to put them into a higher to say okay and but we know we can't get down to uh absolute zero. yeah therefore the bits are error for me. Yeah. Because you can't, that's what I wrote to Charles, you can't get this. Yeah, yeah. He didn't even answer that. I was disappointed with it because he failed to answer the report. So when I write an email like this, you always answer the report question and post. Sometimes you are probably part of me, but, but always you see, see what I really mean. And he, he was writing around it. And it actually, it's a bit catalytic way because it was for debating papers. So, which I've called, I know. Can right? you send me this response? Good. So let's continue. Uh, sorry. Um, so, um, so I'm, so this is, um, this shows you, um, kind of, uh, a precursor to the, to the Schrödinger equation, which is an equation that describes, um, the, the relationship between the C, which I will explain in a minute, what it and and the Hamiltonian. So what is this? So C i of t is the likelihood to find a particle in step C in one of the base states E. So this is like what I said here. So this could, could be a, to be a particle, and and C i is the likelihood of finding it in one of the base states. For example, if the base state would be x, right? The base states are modern as co like coordinates in a coordinate system, and CI is the likelihood of finding a particle in, in, the, in one of the base states. And as you can see, this likelihood is, um, is, uh, is time dependent. And so if you um, uh, had created compute the derivative by T, that's equal to summing up over the different um, base states of the system and adding them together. So this sum is again reminds you of what we've seen here, that the, such amplitudes are always made up of sums of the elements of the elements in the base states. And um, this is this is a matrix that gives you the coefficients um, with which you so these coefficients we saw here a coefficient, right? And this matrix gives you the coefficients for doing this in higher dimensions than if you have only one dimension. And um, so matrix H has to include the thing we are doing to the system to cause it to change. If we know the, 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 the numbers that are in the matrix, we have a complete description of the behavior of the system in time. And, and Hamilton was the first who invented this matrix as a way to calculate the position of particles in, in classical mechanics. So he, there was a guy before him who was called by Branche who formalized Newton's law in, in, the, in a very elegant frame using differential calculus. And then Hamilton formalized it even more elegantly with this matrix notation, matrix notation, proper English. And, 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 uh, and here you can see 
how the elements of the matrix are added together and multiplied with this with this amplitude. This is a picture of Hamilton. This is a daguerreotypie because when he lived, there was no photo yet. So the, the precursor of the modern photography. And I don't know why he's distorted. He's not. He looks a bit better if he if he's not horizontally distorted. Um, so it has to do with the arrangement of the screen. So the Hamiltonian is equal to its transposed complement. So this star means transposed complement. That's when you turn around the matrix and exchange every element of the matrix with the complement, which was its Z. So that means when you, so you remember Z, Z is equal to um, X plus E times Y and Z complement is X minus E times Y. So when you have to take the matrix and, and replace all its elements, turn it around like this and then replace all its elements by the by their composite that, that, that doesn't change the matrix. So it's a, it's a unitary matrix and the total probability of to know it's a, it's, it's equal to its transpose complement and the total probability of finding a particle is, is then the sum of each of the amplitudes. Um, and that's of course, um, that is, is independent of time. And, um, so now to make this a bit clearer, if we have only one single particle, like, like an atom at rest. So if you would freeze um, a helium atom to, to zero Kelvin, then it's at rest and, and it is in only one state. So, and then you keep it frozen like this, then um, the, the physical circumstances are not change, changing with time. And so H is then independent of time. This now gives for one single value, it gives you, so, so the matrix, bigger matrix of H, you know, contains, for example, one times two matrix could contain H11, H12, H21, H22. But now we have a matrix with only one element, which is, which is H1. And so we say for this single um, uh, uh, probability or amplitude of C being in the one state that the system can have, if we calculate the derivative of this by time, this is equal to the product of the first element of the matrix multiplied by the value of C. And so, and if, if not H11 is constant, then the solution is even simpler. Um, if you, if you now calculate the solution to this is differential equation, because we, here you have a, a variable and here is the differential of a variable in one equation. So that's called a differential equation. And the solution of this is another equation and it says C1 is E, the exponent of E divided by H times 11. H11 times T. And so, um, so this is, and E is also called the, the matrix H is also called the energy matrix because E11 is the energy here, right? So this is, you saw this earlier with the, with the momentum P and that's of course another form of momentum together with mass gives you the energy. And this is also a form of expressing the energy. So this is, is the, is the quantum mechanical, um, uh, expression of, of, of an, a system with one state. And now here we have, we have, if we have a two state system, so this is the ammonia molecule and the ammonia molecule, um, maybe I should read this out first. This is so funny. Now this molecule, like any other, has an infin infinite number of st states. It can spin around any possible axis. It can be moving in any direction, can be vibrating inside and so on and so on. It is therefore not a two-state system at all, but we want to make an approximation that all other states remain fixed because they don't enter into what we are concerned with at the moment. This is a very strong move in physics all the time. Problems get simplified to one aspect of the system that is interesting and all the rest is abstracted away. We will consider only that the molecule is spinning around its axis of symmetry as shown in the figure, that it has zero translational momentum that is vibrating as little as possible. And so you see, you have this axis here the molecule is spinning around it, and now it has two states, either with the nitrogen atom up, or it can spin around like this, and then the nitrogen is down. That's the second state. So this is state one, and this is state two. And um, so if we express this with the Hamiltonian, we see we have basically two equations. We have this equation describing this, the, the likelihood of being in state one, and and, um, and this is the likelihood of being in state two. And you see that now you have a more complicated Hamiltonian with four entries. I messed up the notation here, it should be like this, of course. 
and 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 so now you see that that the likelihood of each of the two states is composed as a linear combination of the two states with these parameters, which are usually complex numbers. What is important? It seems to me it's just about uh, clockwise and anti-clockwise spinning. No. It's up or down. It's it's in both cases anti-clockwise spinning. You see the arrow points into the this arrow here is the same. It's both times anti-clockwise spinning, but here the nitrogen is pointing up, and here the nitrogen is pointing down. So it's about the orientation of the nitrogen with regard to the spinning axis. If you take the, uh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. it's. Does it, this have anything to do with spin? No, this is another step. So this is interesting. So, so each, so this is exactly, I, I showed you this example because I showed you that you can regard any property as quantum mechanical property and call it a state. So here we have two base states of the molecule. We have the base state nitrogen pointing up and the other base state nitrogen pointing down. And they are now the two in this physics as theater reduction to one, to two states. These are the two basic states. Another situation, it's the spin up or down. In another situation, it's the polarization of a photon. In another situation, it may be the the level of the electron on it on the in the in the Planck model of the atom, and so on. So you can you can always select other properties of the system that you look at, call them quantum states, and then calculate them. So this may be a good time to mention our paper. Mm. Barry and I wrote a paper. I can put it up on screen. You mean the quantum one? Yes. Uh, so, which which you might find interesting to read. Um, uh, just um, appeared on Archive. So, I should, should be able to find this one. Yes, this is it. You all know what Archive is, I guess. Yes. So, they don't review papers. Not really. Or they publish our paper. And I know the director of Archie personally, because he's involved in the possible grant application. And he told me that the six weeks was not spent on evaluating the quality of the paper, it was spent on deciding under which category it should go. And in okay. the end, they put it under history of physics. No, history and philosophy of physics. History and philosophy of physics. Yeah, and so this is this is the this is the, the, the our new paper, and um, it's um, uh, it 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 gives you an ontology of physics, and it it uses and it also does this for quantum mechanics. So basically, our idea was to give an ontology um, to show an ontology of of classical physics, so classical mechanics, and then of quantum mechanics to show that our ontological approach can cover both both types of physics so anyhow so so this now here these these two states are selected as a base state therefore the matrix describes combinations of the two base states and when you multiply elements of the matrix with the two states and add them together you ob obtain probabilities of of being in that state and and so this is this is basically uh why only probabilities because as you know quantum mechanics is only probabilistic so uh, which is off now, and and so this is this is what this is what it's about. Um, now, here it's 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 again um, uh, it's it's described um, in in bracket notation. So so this is C, the state you're interested in. And this is so to speak the amplitude of C being. In state one, plus the amplitude of C being in state two, multiplied with the parameter of that state. So this is a linear combination that expresses this state in terms of the two of the two base states one and two. So this is base state one, this base state two, and this is super important, right? So this basically gives you an idea how in quantum mechanics the state of a of a system is always expressed as a linear combination of the basic states, and if you have a a full-fledged quantum system which we can't calculate with you don't have a sum but you have an integral over infinitely many states so a full quantum mechanical state description would be a hilbert space of infinite dimension and this is just a two-dimensional hilbert space 
And so, so this is just what I wanted to demonstrate with this atom, with this molecule of, 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 of ammonium. Now, um, so I want to summarize the laws of quantum mechanics one more time. So phi and C are states of the electron or state of the system. One, two, three, four are the base states. The states are orthogonal, which means that the, so the base states are orthogonal, so it would be, which means that that we have a matrix which is only filled with ones on the diagonal, and there is no likelihood at all to go from one state to, from one base state to the other, but only from one base state to one base state to the same base state. Um, P can be described as a linear combination of the amplitude of all the base states. These are all the base states, and now I say P multiply P amplitude C to be in state one times this complex number two, three, four, and I add them together. And then I can like we did it here. Yeah, this like here. And so this this way we get the, the this linear combination. And if we consider any two states C and C, the amplitude of the set C will also be in to be also be in the state C can be found by projecting the state C into the base states and then projecting from each base state into the state P. So this is P, C to one, one to phi, C to two, two to phi, C to three, C to three, and so on. Summed all together, this gives you the total probability. And this is again what we showed at the very beginning with this analogy um, of the multi slit hole. Why well, I said this equation is so important. Where is this bloody hell? Here. This is so important because this already gives you the idea why you have to sum up all these different amplitudes. Okay, now we we are almost this is uh, this is the first law. This this these are the, and then there's another very important aspect. Um, so if x n is a local state of a particle, then we can define the amplitude of p in that state as the as this. Since the base states are associated with the location along the line, we can think of the amplitude c n as a function of the coordinate x and the write it as c x n. The amplitude six n will in general vary with time and are therefore also function of t. So we obtain this, right? And this is now basically derivative. Here he, Feynman tries to to derive the the, the the Schrodinger equation in a soft way, but we are not going to go through this. So what have we learned so far? This is a kind of of uh, very important summary of of uh, the difference between classical physics and quantum mechanics. So in in classical physics. You have a phase space with individual points. I need to make this bigger. No. Um, oh, this is actually better, isn't it? Yes, now you can sense it. Oh, I see this talk. I would like to show you how Hamilton, he looks so much like a frog, but he looks better, but anyhow. So, so classical mechanics makes use of a phase space whose individual points represent possible states of a physical system. And and with su with subsets of points representing physical properties. So, for example, um, you you all know that that in a classical physical system you don't have any um, any uh, irrational um, sorry um, complex. complex numbers, but you have but you have um, um, you have only, for example, classical coordinate system, and then you have a point somewhere, another point, and you have locations defined of the point, and also you can define if it's a moving body, you can not only define its location at a given time, um, but you can also, let's say, define its momentum. And then with time and momentum, you have a phase state defining where the point is and how fast it is moving, right? And, and so um, this is the phase space of classical mechanics. Uh, quantum mechanics uses a complex Hilbert space and physical properties correspond to subspaces. And so a one-dimensional subspace is what we call the state, right? And so this, such a one-dimensional subspace is, is a line and it's called a ray in quantum mechanics. And one ray is what is, so what is a, a, single, a single point in classical physics is now a ray in quantum physics. And, and the ray expresses that, that you can take, um, that you can take the, um, we had it here with the, um, with a very simple Hamiltonian, where is this? It's only H1 here. In this equation, we, mu we, we multiply this with one complex number. But if we, but, but we can have infinitely many complex numbers with which we can multiply the C. And by doing this, we get the, a line. 
right? So if you multiply it by one, we get a value. If you multiply by two, another value, and another, and another. And so because there are infinitely many complex numbers, we can imagine that, that we can basically parameterize the, the particle to be everywhere on the ray. So the ray is what is the point. So, so that means that in quantum mechanics, there is no single point where anything is, but there's always a ray. And, and is it, you're, you're drawing a continuum with your hands yes. now. Doesn't that contradict the quantum idea? No, because, because when you measure the particle, you get a likelihood of it being at a certain point. And the quantization that you're now referring to occurs by the Planck constant. So we've seen the Planck constant because, because um, where is it? Where's an equation that contains the Planck constant here, right? So, so we have here the Planck constant in this exponent, but we can still get an infinite, infinite number of, of, of points. It, they're just spaced in a certain way because the Planck constant, right? So the quantization comes in by the Planck constant, which, which expresses that only at certain regular intervals we get so that we can measure a quantum phenomenon. Oh. But, but, but basically, it's still a line because there are infinitely many values of H. You know? so, so, that's... so there is a line, but we can only measure uh, certain discrete points along the line. Yes, exactly. exactly. And, and this is why, why the atom, and this is when we build a standard Gallag apparatus that splits the beam, we basically have such a measuring machine that measures two discrete points. Um, uh, but 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 we must imagine that that uh, that the the particle itself can of course be anywhere. But but w with our experimental setting, we can only measure certain points, and and th and this is a quantization. And now now um, so now. The, not, the, the logical negation in classical mechanics, the logical negation of the property P that corresponds to a set of points P in space, phase page, um, which is to say the property not P is represented by the set theoretic complement PC of the set P. So here you see this, um, but in quantum, no, it's actually, so, so this is the point, for example, a certain point, and the complement are all the other points in the phase space where the particle is not. In quantum mechanics, it's different. Quantum case, the negation is an orthogonal complement of the subspace. So here we have, here we have, for example, um, a array which is spin in z direction, and its negation is the orthogonal spin in z minus direction. So in, in quantum mechanics, uh, a negation is an orthogonal ray orthogonal to the ray i was to the first ray and so so you now you have to think of um uh of the collection of all vectors in hilbert space that are orthogonal to the to every vector in the subspace as a complement and if p is a projector onto p its negation is presented by the vector projector one minus one minus p so this is this is kind of how this works and this is a picture trying to depict that in quantum space, the basic dimensions, the states are rays. And um, now, so there's a very diff profound difference between classical and quantum properties, which is illustrated by considering a two-dimensional Hilbert space representing possible properties of a spin-half particle. So a spin-half particle is schematically shown on the right. The line P through the origin is a physical property of, of spin of the positive spin one half in units of the Planck constant. Again, this is where the quantization comes in. The line P per perpendicular to this line is, is its orthogonal complement and represents the physical property of spin minus one half in the Z direction. The key point is that there are many other lines to the origin, such as Q, which is now the spin um, in direction X. Um, and they are neither the same as the property SZ, which is a spin in the Z direction, nor its negation ZZ minus one half. And you see here that also there is, of course, a complement to X, which would be X minus, which would be now here, right? And so you have infinitely many angles in which you can measure the spin, and each gives you a spin and a counter spin. You know, you have infinitely many. And so you have infinitely many possibilities 
of determining the location of your point. And and so um, this is this is very important. And what we say in quantum mechanics is we we have two properties. For example, um, P and Q, they are in they are in they are in incompatible when the projectors onto the corresponding subspace do not commute. So when P times Q is not Q times P. And so when we don't have commuting operators, then we have a situation that lacks this precise analog in classical physics. For example, entanglement. And we will understand entanglement a bit in a bit. But quantum entanglement, entanglement doesn't allow such a subspace commutation. And so if there's no such commutation, um, then we have then we can't we can't have an analog in classical physics. Um, and so, so this evolution from the stern galach apparatus to, to Schrödinger finding his famous equation took only five years. And um, it was a great historical moment marking the birth of the quantum mechanical description of matter. It occurred when Schrödinger first wrote down his equation. For many years, the internal atomic structure of matter had been a great mystery. No one had been able to understand what held matter together, why there was a chemical binding, and especially how it could be that atoms could be stable. Schrödinger's discovery of the proper equations of motion of electrons on an atomic scale provided a theory from which atomic phenomena could be calculated quantitatively, accurately, and in detail in principle. So that was why it was such a big revolution, because suddenly you could calculate exactly why a hydrogen atom is stable and which different variants of the hydrogen atom exist. Uh, so you, deuterium and tritium could also be calculated, and also the helium atom. And so the equation is capable of explaining all atomic phenomena except those involving magnetism and relativity. It explains the energy levels of an atom and all the effects of chemical binding. So this is so so um, attractive and, and you know effective that now there are quantum simulators that can simulate the binding of a ligand to a protein. So if you know the chemical structure of a protein, so its amino acids, how they are constituted in space. And you know this exactly, and you know where you know which electrons residues are. You can use Schrödinger equation systems to calculate to try to predict the position of a ligand towards these electron charges. You you have to then again abstract a little bit, but but this is really fascinating that you can now do calculations about matter so precisely. But it's only true in principle because soon the mathematics becomes too complicated to solve exactly any but the simplest problems. Only the hydrogen and helium atoms have been calculated to high accuracy. However, with various approximations, some fairly sloppy, Feynman says, <laughs> some fairly sloppy is so lovely. <laughs> well, many of the facts of more complicated atoms and of chemical binding of molecules can be understood. So in quantum chemistry, you have to simplify a bit, but you can still use the quantum principle to calculate uh, relationships of matter. And it's very fascinating. And that was possible due to, to the Schrodinger equation which I'm not showing because it takes a day to, to teach it how to get them. Um, now, um, we know we have already helped a superposition. A superposition is that the quantum particle is not in one of the base states, phi i, but that it is a combination, like I showed here for two, for just two um, states, combination of the values it, it has in the two states. So, so if it's projected onto the two states, and this is a, a quantum superposition, and basically all quantum in a quantum computer, all quantum bits are in superposition state. So there is, there are. I mean, when you measure a quantum bit, as we will see in a, in a while, you obtain a pure state, an approximation of a pure state, but it's not really a pure state. So that means that 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 if you let's say you have two base states like in a qubit. And now you measure it, um, you get almost zero, almost one, but you have still a very tiny complex number in front of the other parameter. So you have something like 0.99999 times one state or 0.0001 times the other. So it's very, you don't get a, a so you have always superposition in quantum. Uh, in, in the, in, and that's why they are always, that's why it's a rail, a line, right? Because you have infinitely many points. However, um, However, there is something else in superposition, which is entanglement. And so let me explain to you what entanglement is. So entangled particles can be prepared experimentally. For example, you can take a photon 
and polarize it um, to generate a pair of low energy spin one half photons. Oh yes, I wanted to give you an example of a spin one uh, a particle photon has spin one. Yeah, so photon has spin one, and you can get out of it. You can get two weak energy photons of spin one half. And here, and so, so the the two spin one half particles here. You have particle A and B. They are in the superposition of states. So if x direction spin up is measured for particle P one, then spin down is always measured for particle P two, if even if they're far apart. And this is also true um, for, so actually this is, I think, a wrong notation, but it doesn't matter now. So this should be P1, P2, but, but basically you see that the first particle has X, has, uh, is, is a mixture. Oh no, sorry, these are the two particles. No, that, that was correct. So these are, I had just to think about it a bit. So, so, um, this is the first particle, this is the second particle. The first particle has um, X spin up and the second is X spin down. Um, and, and so this is, this is, the, this is that, that this particle has the opposite states than this particle, right? And this means the combination of the two spaces. It's called the tensor. And, and so, um, if you measure now this particle in x direction, it will have x direction up, and the other one will always have the opposite direction. But if you don't measure one of the particles, you don't know one which one has spin up and which one has spin down. And now the interesting thing is, if you produce the two particles and take them away from each other very far, and you do the measurement on one, then you always have the opposite measurement of the other. And, and that has, that has, that is called uh, non-locality of quantum mechanics. Though, you know, the point is that when you create the particle, you basically encode already this opposite information. Now, if you take them apart and measure one particle, then the other one always has the opposite and they can't communicate because they're so far apart that even if they could only communicate by some unknown means above the speed of light. Now we know that the speed of light is the highest speed that can be attained in the universe. So basically, you take them so far apart that they cannot communicate, and then you do these measurements and you find out that their spin is opposite. And this is called entanglement. And the question is, how can this be? How can it be that we don't know which particle is which? That, but we know it upon measurement. We don't understand this, but we can describe it with this equation. And um, so, and so these these states are incompatible, right? So, so what does this mean? So. Um, um sorry this slide is messed up the quantum counterpart of the phase space is Hilbert space h a complex vector space with an inner product an element of h here it should be here is denoted as psi the inner product is written like this should group them so that it doesn't mess itself up again. It's, it's not groupable. It's such a silly software. You see, that's the, the consequence of Microsoft having the monopoly on this. So they don't have to make an effort to make it really good. So, so um, and so the inner product, that's, uh, is like, and so the counterpart of a point in classical phase space is a one-dimensional subspace of the Hilbert space array consisting of all multiple C times C of some, some non-zero C. We see an arbitrary complex sum. I've explained this. So this is why it's a line, because we can have infinitely many Cs. Array is determined by a dyadic operator. So you can, you can basically say this year, this pet bra determines array in linear algebra notation. And so if you take this, if you take this operator and apply it to a cat, then you get this. And and this this basically um, uh, allows you to measure to measure um, quantum uh, quantum magnitudes, and so um, this is a certain in, uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics invented by Omnis and Griffiths. We don't have to go into this now, but basically, I just want to explain it a bit to you, so so that you know what a projector is. So 
if you have um, two projectors P and Q that measure um, or describe some properties, like for example, spin in X and spin in Y direction. And if the two projectors commute, so their products um, are, are, the product is exchangeable, the order of it is exchangeable, then they commute. And only when this condition is fulfilled, the product itself is a projector and it projects into a subspace P and Q in agreement with quantum logic. But if it's not like this, so then the conjunction P and Q is meaningless in the sense that the history interpretation assigns it no meaning. In other words, one cannot assign two incompatible properties to one quantum system at the same time. So therefore, um, we can't interpret the singlet entanglement because let's see, we, the singlet entanglement this year, this is the singlet entanglement where you have two photons which are entangled, one in the one, probably one direction, the other in the, the other direction. And now you, um, so this is again um, a way of expressing this, this expression of this of this uh, of this. And now let's look at states A and B. So a projector A tensor B is A tensor. This is the matrix filled with ones times this. This represents a property of the dyadic product product space A tensor B. B is the conjunction of the separate properties of the subsystems A and B. So so basically. You have you have two rays which describe a property of the system like the spin direction and if you have a tensor b then you basically have the conjunction of these two properties so that means a particle having both being being projected with this projector has both properties for example um, spin a and positive and spin b negative is is is, is a commuting operator which, which assigns a projector to the particles A and B. And basically it says particle A is Z spin direction positive and particle B is X spin direction negative. So you could say, if you have a standard apparatus arranged like this, that is the Z direction, the particle flies like this. And if you turn it by maybe 45 degrees, you get X direction, now the particles will be separated like this. You know, and so this, this, and so if you do this on two different particles, if you have two different particles, one has gone through one standard apparatus, the other one through the other. Now both can be assigned, um, uh, assign the spins to these particles, and that's perfectly interpretable. But in the entanglement, this projector, there is no projector that commutes, and therefore we cannot. So if we project something into this singlet entanglement, there is no commute. There is no there is no such tender product. And if there's no tender product, we cannot say anything about the spin of A or B. Um, um, we, 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 um, uh, in, in the direction, unless we measure the Z direction, but we can't say anything about any other direction because of the entanglement. And, and so, and so um, th this, this just is to show you <clears throat> that mathematically, um, those those paradoxical quantum states correspond to states for which we have non-commuting projectors. And and this, um, why am I showing this to you? Because we get to projectors with, with quantum computers and, and we will also deal with entanglement there. So, what time is it now? Okay, so we, it's still one o'clock until one o'clock we have, right? So, yes. Since you've been working on so hard. Well, I do. I will do what I think I will do is at least the quantum bits. Okay. So, so now we have. No, I think you should let people ask yes. about it. Or does everyone understand entanglement? <laughs> to be fair, there is a lot of people who are dying. It would take way too long, probably, to, uh, to explain. So let me see if I can describe the scenario. We have a photon which we split into two photons, one of which has a spin and the other of which has a complementary spin. Mm -hmm. And we send the second photon uh, thousands of miles away. Yes? That's yes. Right. Yeah. And then we change the spin of the first photon. And even though there's no way in which they can be communicating with each other, the no, we don't change it, we measure it. We measure it. Okay, can't keep talking. 
So, so maybe to make this one more, I think I misunderstood when I first saw this equation. So what you see here, uh, this equation describes the spin in x direction. This equation describes the spin in z directions. Yeah. These are two different singlet entanglements. One with regard to x, one with regard to z spin. Okay, so they are both are, are describing different stern galach apparatus, if, if you would like so. And this here, this this is one state of particles A and B, in which A has spin up and B has spin down. This is the other state of particles A and B, where A has spin down and B has spin up. So A and B are the two particles. I think I got this wrong last time. So this is, and so we, and so the, what this expresses is that there is basically a mixed state between this tensor and this tensor. This tensor describing A being spin up, this tensor describing B being spin down, and this tensor describing X being spin down and X being spin up. Now, when we make the measurement, we discover that X is A is spin up, then we know that B is always spin down. Though now they are they are separate uh, geographically. Um, if and if we discover that X is spin down and B is spin up, then we then B will always be up. So this and, and the same in Z direction. However, the the, the two projectors. These projectors don't really commute. Although there's a tensor product shown here, the projectors corresponding to these don't commute, as is shown here, right? So, so this tensor product of A and B commutes doesn't commute. Um, uh, um, projects. So the same thing projects onto A B with C, but only commutes with the projector zero and one on A and B. But it doesn't commute. With, with the tensor product. And so though there is a tensor indicated here, there is no mathematical commutation because we cannot change the order of the two projectors um, mathematically. And so therefore, that's what Omnis and, and um, 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 Griffiths. Griffiths say. Therefore, this is not an interpretable state, right? So you can't, because non-projecting, non-commuting projectors, which are measurements of the quantum state, non-commuting projectors mean that there is no way to assign there is that the that the that the tensor product doesn't need to assign two reliable properties to the particles in question. The particles in question. So the 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 tensor product of the projector doesn't assign um, interpretable properties to the particles in question. And so that's you can see here because you don't know unless you do a measurement, you don't know yeah. which of the particles is spin up and spin down. No. You only know that they are antisensical. So in this way, the um and this the apparent paradox that you can have a photon photon being changed in some way in one part of the universe gives rise to an equal opposite an opposite change in another photon. This paradox is eliminated by Griffiths. It's not eliminated. It's just, it's just, um, it, it, he just says that basically the, the entanglement has no, it's uninterpre uninterpretable. And my interpretation in this case is that we created the entanglement with the machine that created the entangled photons, but uh, we, because we don't understand what's really going on, yeah. we can just say there is an entanglement, but we don't know in which direction which photon is, and this gets only revealed um, uh, when uh, when we measure the photons. It's so, you. are the, the the properties let's say we take the spin in the x uh, direction? Mm -hmm. uh, is this property dependent or independent of the spin in the z direction? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So they are not only independent, they are, they are totally, for the same particle, they are mutually exclusive. That's because of the, that's another instance of the Heidelberg principle. That's why I introduced the Heidelberg principle. So if I measure the spin in the x direction, I can't measure anymore the spin in the z direction because I have the, what's called the collapse of the wave function. It's, that's how it's called in quantum mechanics. And that means that, that I don't have a wave anymore after the measurement that is like the wave before, that I now have information about this particle in with regard to a certain dimension, but I can't obtain it anymore for um, uh, for for another dimension. And um, it's basically like, 
the particle sends the particle through a Stern Gerlach apparatus, and now it hits, it split and it hits the screen. I see it on the screen, but now it has lost its properties because now it's not anymore flying in the beam, but it's now condensed on the glass plate, right? So now I have information about it, which spin it had, but I've lost the quantum system, the, the wave. It's not anymore a wave. It has now become a physical piece of dust that I see on the glass plate. And so in this way, I've destroyed the wave character of the particle by measuring it. And this is what happens here as well. And you can only measure in one, in one, uh, the spin in one dimension. That's why on a quantum computer, you only measure always in one dimension. Because you can, you can't. Afterwards, the particle is sort of be gone. But that then means that, given that there is an infinite amount of angles on which we can measure spin, that the the particle has an infinite amount of independent, exclusive properties. Yes. Yes. This. this is a very clever statement, and this we will see at tomorrow at the end of the lecture when we get to maybe we are faster. And that's by the way, this infiniteness is expressed by the is by the by the index w so you know that you have x y and z these are three axes but if, if i spin my hand like this they can be anywhere on the sphere right and w expresses this that they are arbitrary right and now and now um so one qubit has has an infinite amount an infinite amount of uh, it's a continuous variable it can have an infinite amount um of of combinations and and so that's the fundamental difference between the quantum computer and the classical computer. Is the classical computer there is electricity on the channel or not, on the gate or not. And if there's no electricity, it's zero. If there is electricity, it's one. And and uh, sometimes you can also have uh, have uh, errors in, in 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 single bit measurements. But but this taken aside, basically um, uh, in a in a quantum computer, each qubit has an infinite amount of uh, of very of, of possible instances, but when you measure, you can only measure one. And the problem is, how do you, before you do the measurement, how do you manipulate this infinite amount before you do your measurement and keep it so that you get the regularities that you want in a gated circuit, right? Because in a classically gated circuit, everything is regular according to the laws of Boolean logic, but how do you want to maintain this regularity in a quantum computer? And that, that's what we are going to think about. So, Arndt and Griffiths have a relatively sober view of entanglement, but there are some people who think that we can use quantum entanglement in order to, to do quantum communication over long distances in a way which will be preventing people listening from yes. the outside. Yes. How, how, do those people have a point that we can use? Yes, so, so we, can, we, can already, we can already do it now for short distances. Because we can use the entanglement, and I could, I don't, I have to, I didn't prepare this. It's called quantum teleportation. So that the entanglement, so when basically there's a circuit that, that, uh, or uh, an experiment is set up where you can basically prepare uh, a, a particle, and um, then you can send this particle um, uh, to, um, another party, you can then measure yourself the particle and give this other part of the measurement result. And then this measurement result is meaningless to anyone who doesn't have the particle. But if you combine this measurement result with the particle, you can then decipher the code. And, and so this quantum, this entanglement can indeed be used for secure communication because you don't even have to encrypt the, the transmitted uh, measurement result anymore because somebody who doesn't have the particle will not be able to do anything with it because there are infinitely many possibilities and you have picked one and now this is this property is used for the other to decipher the particle and so with this you could you can create quantum communication the, the big problem with this is that we don't have quantum repeaters and so because quantum particles lose their properties when they get transported over after a certain time you would have to have a quantum repeater that basically measures the property of the particle and then create recreate the particle in exactly the same way and transport it to the next repeater so that you always freshen the particle the, the inform and we don't know how to build such quantum repeaters so so therefore right now the dream of of secure communication by quantum teleportation as it's called which is not the teleportation because you need to transmit in a conventional way your measurement results 
but because of this, because we don't have, we, so this has been done, but only over short distances, because because the particle, the many particles can lose their quantum state in a millisecond. So so you need, well, you can, at the speed of light, you can travel quite far in a millisecond. So that's 300, kilo, 300 kilometers, right? And so therefore, yes, it's 300 kilometers in a millisecond. And therefore, I think the longest experiment is 200 kilometers that has been performed. So because within 200 kilometers of this travel distance, the particle did not lose yet its quantum property that you wanted to use for this for this quantum teleportation. But so you would have to have, so if you think of the United States, um, uh, uh, now maybe we can build a quantum system that, that the best systems, I think, lose the quantum the entanglement property in a millisecond. So maybe you can build with half a millisecond. But well, that gives you then 600 instead of 300 kilometers. Now, then you would have to have a repeater every 500 kilometers. So that would be 12 repeaters across the United States just to communicate within the United States. In Germany, it's a bit easier because you just need two or two one repeaters, but you still need at least one. In Luxembourg, it works really well, <laughs> or at least in style. <laughs> But they are not the world powers, you know, who look for quantum, quantum communication. So now in, in Luxembourg, you could already, one Dienststelle could already inform the other one about a secret today with quantum teleportation. Russia would have a hard time. Russia would have, from Vladivostok to Moscow, it's, I think, it's 10,000 kilometers, so you need 20 quantum repeat. So, so this is why it doesn't work. So you had another question? Okay. So, but, but this is, this is basically, this entanglement, um, I, I, I have much more, I have a full set of slides explaining the whole theory of Griffiths, but this is not the right moment to show it. Um, he has this book, if you're interested in this, it's called Consistent Quantum Theory, it appeared in 2002 in Cambridge. It summarizes, there are three authors who have Omnis, Griffiths, and the third one who have written book about consistent quantum theory. All of them have the same trick, that they basically the same trick with the commute, commuting yeah. um, operators, but but I think Griffith's book is the one that presents it in the best, really the best way. So, but you need uh, quite a lot of mathematical knowledge. But it's a great book. So anyhow, so let's. So what is a qubit? So quantum computers they don't use bits but qubits. And here you have a qubit symbolized in a very primitive way as the two basic states of some physical system. And so. So quantum computers can speed up some computational problems, but oh God, what's that? But in practice, this has, has not shown has not really been shown. So in practice, it has been shown that the qubit has been built, and also logical qubits have been built, which are which are several physical qubits that make up one one real qubit, uh, one logical qubit. To, to do error correction, this is, but but no nobody has yet calculated anything useful as a quantum computer. Like for example, the Fourier transformation, which is what the quantum computers would be much better at than classical computers, because we don't have quantum computers of the sufficient size. Now, what are qubits? They are systems with two base states and many superposition states. An example of such a system is the spin vector of an electron or two energy levels of an atom. And so now the base states are always modeled like this. The vector for, for zero is, is a vector of one and zero, and the vector for one is just the opposite, right? So this is how you model in a two-dimensional space, you, you do your base vectors. Now, this, this, this doesn't come across right on this, on this slide because of the projector. Maybe I could change it, but I'm afraid that then I will kind of lose. No, 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 no. Yeah, I think then I will lose the completely lose it because, but it, it looks like an old, but it's really a sphere, perfect sphere. And on this perfect sphere, now you have here, you have to state zero and to state one, uh, so, sorry, state one and state zero. And there was a psi is here. Did you touch the, did you press the No. But suddenly the Google recording is out of sync. I can stop it and restart it. No, Try going backwards to what the slide in about a minute. And now go forward again. Um, okay, maybe I'm offline. No, because I can see your face. Your face is moving. Just the slide didn't move. Let me stop stop presentation and represent presentation.
So, okay, now the slide is good. So here you see um, you see the sphere, and that psi is one state of the qubit, and this is express can be expressed as alpha times zero plus beta times one. That's a linear combination that expresses the arbitrary qubit state. And as you pointed out, there are infinitely many, infinitely many of them because A and B are complex numbers and the only restriction is that they need to be there, their sum needs to be one. Why is that the case? Because it's a sphere, right? So this is just Pythagoras. And, um, and uh, so that, but, but basically because we have Pythagoras here, we can also express A and B uh, in terms of the sine and the cosine, which works like this. This is the Euler theorem. You don't, you can look it up, but it's it's Euler's equation applied to, 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 to this. And now you don't have alpha and beta as complex number as anymore, but you now have um, uh, polar coordinates defined by the angle. So this angle, which which um, is used to to operate on the zero state vector is theta and the one for the um, uh, the other is phi and so you see here you, you now combine theta and phi to define the position of psi with regard to the two basic uh, dimensions and because this factor is not observable in qubits we can drop it or set it to one and then we obtain this so, and there are, because there are infinite number of qubit states, so therefore quantum computers manipulate continuous magnitudes. So they basically manipulate quantum mechanical waves in the infinite Hilbert space, while classical computers manipulate discrete bits. And this is the fundamental reason why quantum computers have the potential to be much faster than, than classical computers. However, it's much harder to manipulate a continuous magnitude than a classical discrete bit, which can only take values of zero and one. This is super important to understand. Are there questions to this? What's it that, uh, that is being manipulated? Is, is it the angle of heat that is being manipulated such that if you get, because that would, no, wait, that, that would just correspond to which. So what is being manipulated? So when you create a quantum, when you have a, a quantum computer with one bit only, I would talk about So when you have a quantum computer with only one bit, um, and you initialize it, you try to set the state to zero. And if you have eight bits as well, you set all. You try to. Sorry, it was too loud. You try to set all the states to zero. Now, when you have, when you now initialize this, you have. You can imagine that you have a superposition of all the qubits of the quantum computer into one big wave. So you, so you don't have a wave equation for, for each single qubit, but you now have the superposition across the two exponent eight bits, okay? And now, so that's, in this case of eight bits, 256 continuous variables, contributing all to the wave, but you don't know the shape of the wave. So you just know that you have a quantum mechanical superposition in the in this 8-bit register and now you start manipulating it by applying energy for example to single bits by doing this you are changing the shape of the entire curve of the entire quantum mechanical wave until at the end of your manipulations you make a measurement that's that's how you manipulate so you are basically manipulating the whole register with the quantum gate so let's that's and so this is what i mean with manipulating so um, but before I can explain it, I first have to explain a quantum measurement. So, so quantum measurements are described by a collection of measurement operators. These are operators which act on the state space of the system that is measured. So when you measure this, this here, you actually assign it either a one or a zero. You can't measure these angles. Now that's now again the discretization of quantum mechanics that we are asking for. Although, Barry, you have an infinite number of positions on the two lines of, of the two rays, zero and one. When you measure, you can only get one value, zero or one. So now we have again the quantization phenomenon, right? And, and, and um, so 
the index M here refers to the measurement outcome that is may occur in the experiment. So the quantum experiment is just zero and one in a quantum computer. And if the state of the quantum system is psi immediately above the measurement, then the probability that result M occurs is the following. So you, you have psi, uh, bra, cat, psi, and then you have this operator in the middle that you have to multiply and you have to, this means complicated integration operation, but at the end you get a certain probability. And so after you've done this measurement, you get this measurement operator times C divided by the by this, which is which is just a normalizing factor to express that you have now basically um, that this is normalized between zero and one. And so the, the measurement operator satisfies the completeness equation. So that means if you if you have two of them and you multiply these two operators, this is the inverted um, transposed uh, uh, complement. So this is a complement matrix. Then you get the identity matrix. And so the most important measurement we have is the measurement of a qubit in the computational basis. So th this is the measurement of a single qubit with two outcomes, M0 and M1. And now... Um, now you basically get basically get zero or one if you apply this measurement to the system p right and um uh and and usually this factor here is 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 not taken into account but you only want to know the zero and one so so this is this is what you what you measure and of course um so this is the state that we had before and now you want to see whether it's one or zero and then you do this kind of measurement and now comes back to a question. So quantum computer performs calculations by manipulating qubits within a quantum register. So a quantum register is a set of several qubits that are chained together in one quantum register. And the quantum computer performs calculations by manipulating qubits within a quantum register. The state of a quantum register is the two exponent n-dimensional Hilbert space, the tensor product of the state space of the single qubit. So, so here you have the single qubits, and they are, and the, their tensor product um, of the vectors gives the quantum space. Here you see what a tensor product is. So if you have this vector and this vector, the tensor product gives a matrix of size n times n. So it's this times this, and this and this field is this times this, and this field is this times this, times this times this, and so on, until you fill the whole matrix. That's a tensor product, which gives you your new state space. And you you have to be aware that each of those is already infinite because e this each qubit has a has a um uh it's a complex vector space as is indicated by the c and has and has um has infinitely many values and out of this you make this um uh, this this big hilbert space that that is gets more and more complicated as you're adding more qubits and with a thousand qubits you have now the 10 exponent 1000 dimensional Hilbert space, um, but which has infinite, but each of the dimension of the Hilbert space is, is continuous and not discrete. Whereas in a quantum, in a classical computer, they are all discrete. And so this is the space in which the computation happens. And so, so let's look at a very simple um, uh, base of this vector space. That is, of course, the basis one and zero. And the register of two, two qubits has then this basis. Zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. But of course, the state of the register is now a superposition of the base set of this form. So what you have now is, so you have now two base, sorry, two um, bits. And so this is bit one and bit two. But now you can multiply um, the first bit, so 0, 1, and 0, so this is 0, 1, zero this is 0, 0, this is 0, 2, so 0, 0, and 0, 1. And now you can multiply them, or you have to multiply them with, with, with a complex, complex number for each of the basis states. So this is the basis state. Is, is, is multiplied with one or complex number. The next base state with another complex number and the next and the next, so that you now have the sum of the four base states, each multiplied with one with one different complex number. And that gives you this, this is a very important equation because it shows you that in a classical computer, you would only have the four base states. 
But here, you have to multiply each of the four with a complex number, indicating where you are on the way. And so the superposition that you obtain by the four qubits is really this. So this is, by the way, uppercase C, to indicate that we are not talking about one qubit, but about a register. And now, as you see, you have now infinitely, even in the four qubits, you have four times infinitely many values that together form this complicated way. And now this is the wave equation, so to speak, of your of your um, of your base states. And why is it a wave equation? Because because this cat here that you see here is equivalent to the to the Schrödinger equation. But now the Schrödinger equation is like a superposition of four different Schrödinger equations, each ma each made up of two qubit states, and each each with its own complex number parameter multiplying it. And I think that when mathematicians work with quantum computer theory, they often forget how brittle this is. You know, like the email we saw yesterday. It, it basically shows that the mathematician we're talking to, or in this case, he was even a physicist, but still he forgot it. He, he, he forgot to see that, that, that these are not just the four states. When you measure them, it's only the four states. But when you are calculating with them, at runtime, before you make the measurement, you have an infinite amount of complexity you have to deal with even in the four even if you have just two qubits. And this gets worse and worse the more qubits you're adding because the number of qubits is in the exponent. So it's an exponential growth in complexity. And with, with a thousand qubits, so a thousand qubits, by the way, is the minimum amount of qubits that you need to have, have a practically useful quantum computer. For example, if you think of an RSA, so the RSA, you know, RSA, HTTPS, you know this, right? Protocol on the internet for encryption when you pay with your credit card. The number of the credit card is, 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 is encrypted. And how does this work? The browser obtained a public key from, from an authority that provides public keys for the secure trans, um, and everybody has this public key. Now the, the, now, now the browser, um, let me think, you know, the browser actually, yes, and then there's a private key known only by the authority that is now also known to the credit card company and now when you when you send your your um the encrypted now when you encrypt the the um your 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 transmission you need both the private and the public key to decrypt it and with quantum computing you could you to decrypt it quickly with a quantum computer with no without knowing the private key by by factorization of um by prime number factorization, which is a quantum computer and minimal algorithm, you could crack it without knowing the public private key very quickly. But for this, you need at least a thousand qubits or maybe many more qubits. But then you need to manage two excellent thousand qubits. So more qubits than, and these are more states than we have um, particles in the observable universe. So if we take our strongest telescope, telescope and look at all the at our galaxy and all the other thousands of galaxies that you can see with our strongest telescope and count how many particles these are, these are less than two exponent thousand. So, so, so two exponent thousand is a big number. And that's a number we are facing for quantum computers that have a useful register. So they need a register of a thousand digits. And we will see a bit later why that's the case, but they need big registers. So, um, so this is this equation is extremely important. Yes, question. Okay. Just to clarify if I understand correctly what then the point is, because okay, yeah, let's say this one um four qubits. If you measure the state of the qubit, you will get either one or zero. Yes. So basically northern hemisphere or southern yes. hemisphere, all this yeah. before you measure it, the state is actually on any of the infinite possible yes. points of yes. the sphere. Yes. Um but if you have just one qubit, it's kind of useless because every time it's only always going to be one or two. But when you link two qubits together, you don't have to. It, it basically it can do a computation with any of the infinite values that it has, and only after it's done the computation, you can measure the result again and quantize it. Yeah. So what it, um, the trick that you are doing and we understand is much better for us that you are using the qubits to perform a, a, in a certain style of calculation using quantum gates. We will see how this works tomorrow. And then at the end, you only have to measure out of the many qubits in your register, one single one to get all the information you need to solve your problem. 
that's why it's so hard. So you need to set up, it's very, you need a lot of cleverness. You need to set up a mathematical algorithm that allows you to be, dis to be expressed in this amplitude of a, of a qubit register, but at the end can be obtained, the critical result for it can be obtained with one measurement. And tomorrow we will, there's one very simple algorithm, the Deutsch algorithm, which was the first quantum algorithm which, which works with, with one or two qubits. I have to look, at, we'll see tomorrow, I forgot it, but we'll see tomorrow, which, which, which explains you the principle from which you can understand why it does such a beautiful speed up. Okay, but this we will look at tomorrow and then you, then you will understand how it works in the same way you understand today how the logic gates work. But, but the key is always to, 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 to make implicit usage of the complexity that this allows. And then to nevertheless get all the results you need from one or very few measurements. And this is, this is, this is the, the, the trick of quantum computing. And of course, this not only uses superposition, but also entanglement. So entanglement is super important um, uh, uh, for quantum computing. So this is a two register machine, a two bit, a two qubit register with zero, one, one, zero, right? And now an entanglement state, this is very, this is the same way in entanglement than we saw with the photon, so that we see that it's a mixture of zero, one, one, zero. And this state cannot be factored into a product of the states of the first and second bit. This is quantum entanglement and the main foundation for the high efficiency of quantum computing for some problems. So, so not only is the wave superposition for, many, for several qubits important, but also the entanglement. And the entanglement here, it says, you can't factor it the, into a product of the states of the first and second bit. That's, that means what I said before, that the projectors are non-commuting because we cannot factor this, this sum into a product of the first and the second bit. So this is like the photon entanglement. And these entanglement states are, are critical, are critical for, for quantum computing, and they give the quantum computers their power. Um, because entanglement is a phenomenon that is, does not exist in the classical world, of course, right? How can you maintain a coherent computation if you have this kind of entanglement just between two bits? So basically, you are, you are, you, as we will see in the Deutsch algorithm, you are making usage of the entanglement for elegant computations. The problem is and you elegant. Will elegant computations that save that save you. So you are utilizing the entanglement to save computation steps. Because such an entanglement in the Deutsch algorithm, you can do one computation step instead of two. Because basically by operating on the entangled state, one operation is like two operations. And then when you do the Fourier algorithm, which is um, which is uh, uh, quantum Fourier transformation, then you can do, then you, then it becomes more and more and more efficient. And so this is what we are going to look at tomorrow. But the entanglement basically allows you because because when you manipulate one bit, the other bit gets also automatically entangled, and each computation is a, big, a register manipulation, right? So when you hear the classical computer, you're sending electrons through the gates, and that creates a new flow of electrons. And this is how you manipulate, this, this is why it's called a circuit, right? And at the end, you, you read out a, a register that is connected to your circuit to get your, for example, the addition result. Here, it's different. Here, you, you are not, you, the quantum circuit consists of a series of manipulations of a register. And, and, each, each, and each time you manipulate a register, you, you manipulate all the qubits at the same time. And, 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 and that's, that's what is, what, that's, if you find an algorithm where this creates less computation steps, then you have, uh, the advantages of the quantum computer. And, and, and Deutsch, uh, was the, not, not a German, by the way, I think it was an Englishman, was the first, um, the first in the early nineties to figure out such an algorithm. And then, then in the, in the early two thousands, it was, it was implemented for the first time. And I think that's a paper that, that I was sent yesterday as answer to my question. So, so a quantum gate is a manipulation of a quantum register. Um, so for example, if you have as a quantum a qubit, the state of an atom, the energy level of an atom, and you now you have the electrons on the lower, um, on the lower energy levels of the atom, and you shoot with a laser against it, 
you will elevate the electrons to a high level, and this way you will you will be able to change the state of of the of the of the quantum bit, and this is this is um, um, and this is what a quantum operator does. It changes the quantum register, and a quantum gate is so. If the quantum register is written as uppercase psi, a quantum register maps this psi to a multiplication of of the operator u with psi, and so that's a quadratic matrix which has exactly the same rows and numbers as the qubits of the computer. So if the, if the computer has two qubits, then the matrix is two times two matrix, if it's three qubits, three times three, and so on. And, and this creates, um, and th these rows and comments are also normal with regard to scalar multiplication. So, um, so, so that, that's, that's, it's a quadratic matrix with, with this property. And, and so that, that also means that you can always take plate back, right? So every quantum operation is reversible because of the unitary nature of the matrix. That means when you when you when you you apply this to a to a to a quantum register, which is a vector of zeros and ones, you apply this unitary matrix, you get a result. You can always calculate that on the classical computer you can't. So look here, for example, on the OR, once you have the result that you have a zero or a one. The one can come from three different constellations of the input, so it's not reversible. You don't know anymore what was the input, so what was the input, and and in the quantum computer, um, each each operation on the quantum register is a unitary operator which is fully reversible, and um, and also normal with regard to mathematically speaking, that means it's also normal with regard to scalar multiplication, and um, so so the, the the resulting product is still orthogonal uh, and and uh, and uh, so that means that the the resulting in the resulting matrix the columns uh, well that the columns are always um, the sorry the columns of the um, of the uh, matrix are um, orthogonal so and linear so linear independent and also normalized so um, so this is a quantum gate the quantum op to 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 um, repeat it once more we are starting with one qubit which has impossibly many states, but if we measure it, we can get one base state out. Then we have, we have, we take several quantum bits together, which gives us a quantum register, which is like a vector of zeros and ones. Here's an example. This is um, a two quantum bit quantum register with four base states, zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. And all the, and the, and the, and this state is like a big, Schrödinger wave, um, which is which is which is linear combination of those base states, and this is an entanglement of two base states, and this is a quantum gate. So unlike here, where we have a Boolean table that represents what the what the quantum gate does, or what the logical gate does, the quantum gate is like a matrix multiplication, like matrix multiplication. So that's the matrix. Like technical interference. Yes, but 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 so at the technical level, um, it's a technical level. Yeah, it's not a component like the circuit, but it's like a manipulation of the energy level of the of one or several of the qubits, and and basically what it does, it is it is acting mathematically speaking like a matrix multiplication, and so here's an example. So so this is a negation gate. So it turns around the state of the of, of two qubits. So if you multiply um, uh, this with a qubit which is in state one zero, you get out a qubit with a state a q, sorry a register which is states one and zero. And you multiply this, then you get out states zero and one. Yeah, and so and so um, and so now we have a superposition time on the basis of zero and one on a two qubit computer. And now this means that there are linear combinations of alpha times zero plus beta times one. And you know that zero is in matrix notation. A zero is, is this. Oh no, I think zero is always this. I have to look it up. I'm very bad at remembering this. 
was here at the beginning. Yes. So zero is this and one is this. Now, if you multiply, um, uh, if you multiply, so their linear combination, which is shown here. So if you have alpha times this, Am I getting this right? Yes. Plus beta times this. So I will get rid of all of this. Plus beta times this. Mm -hmm. Then this is alpha and zero and beta and zero and beta. So this is alpha beta. So this is a representation of an arbitrary parametrization of your qubit register with two complex numbers. Now you can take this and multiply this alpha beta times this gate zero one, sorry, it needs to be written down the other way, zero one, one zero times alpha beta. And then you get uh, zero times alpha plus one times beta is beta. And then the, the other one is formed uh, one times alpha plus zero times beta is alpha. So with, with simple math, sorry, it's a bit covered, but I don't have, so I put, I put it back here. Zero, one, one, zero, multiplied by alpha beta equals beta alpha. So because, because of particle multiplication, right? And so, so this, this, this unitary operator just changes the order of the two qubits. And, and so this is super important. So if you think of quantum computation, you have this register, and then you have just many, many such unitary matrices multiplied with the register until you get a certain result of your register, and then you, then you measure one of the two qubits, and that gives you the result of your entire computation. The whole computation is just a long multiplication series of the register with different matrices, which represent the quantum gates. That's it. That's what is mathematically, and and. Um, uh, so, so this result comes from that, that this position is determined by saying zero times alpha plus one times beta. And this position is given by one times alpha plus zero times beta. That's that's just uh, linear algebra, basic linear algebra. Right? This gives you this. And now you can imagine that you have a bigger register. Now you have big matrices, and they all get multiplied. And after that, you get the final result. And and now comes the interesting question. Um, so, so from this, you see that every quantum computer is just a series of matrix multiplications. So therefore, every quantum computer can be simulated by a classical computer, because of course, the classical computer can also ex execute matrix multiplication. However, it's not so. So, so, so it, it, and, and it's, there are cases where the quantum computer needs n steps, and the quantum computer, the classical computer needs n steps, the quantum computer needs square root of n steps. For example, if it would need 100 steps, then the quantum computer would need would need 10. And if it would need 10,000 steps, the quantum computer would just need 100. This looks pretty good, right? The problem is that the quantum computer needs many, many, many more bits than the classical computer to achieve this. And it needs so many more bits that the only computations, the only speed up that is useful to have with the quantum computer is this, which is called, so this is called polynomial speed up, but this is an exponential speed up, where you have basically this. So, so if you have, for example, here, two exponent 10 computations, let me think, eight is 156, nine is 512, so that's 1024. Here, you would only have 10. So this is 100 times speed up. But if you have, let's say, two exponent uh, 12, that's 4,096 computations. With a quantum computer, you would get down to 12. You see, that's amazing, right? So here you need 12 computations, here you need 4,000 computations. And that's called exponential speed up, right? And now think of, I mean, it gets worse. So if you think of you need on the classic computer 20 to exponent 100 computations, that's um, as many particles as we have in the, in the Milky Way, right? 
So it's a huge set of particles. And now if you do the quantum computer, you just have 100 computations, sorry, two, two exponents. You just have 100 computations. So an exponential speed up, and this is what you basically need uh, for if you want to crack encryption with a quantum computer, you apply an algorithm that achieves a speed up, and now you see the difference. So 100 computations that, that can be done, you know, one clock cycle of a quantum computer is, is a tenth of a millisecond. So then you can do this in less than a second, right, on a quantum computer, whereas you would need two to the extent 100 computations on a regular computer, which would take years, or I don't know, thousands of years. So, so, so this shows you that an exponential speed up is very, very attractive. But given what you see here, you understand now that each quantum computer can be, can be, can be simulated um, uh, with, a, with, a, uh, with a normal computer because it's in the end just a series of matrix modifications. I think for today, this was more than enough, I'm afraid. <laughs> and and um, I, Barry, do you,